Good evening. Welcome to the board meeting for the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board of Trustees. This is June 8th, 2022. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you to staff for being out in the audience. Um, we're gonna start out tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance and um, will Trustee Shocker lead us in the pledge? Thank you. If there's someone in the back, yeah, who can turn the lights on, that would yeah, probably be appropriate. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so first up tonight, we'll have um, our superintendent comments from Dr. Rodriguez. So as you know, one of the things that I try really hard to do is to find unique ways in order to be able to receive feedback and um, support and just information from people. So I am out in the schools every day and then in addition to that, um, I'm at ELAC meetings, um, different other meetings. I do things called conversations with the superintendent. And so this is something new that we're going to try to do as well. So in English, we're calling it um, talks and treats, or treats and talk. Um, in Spanish, it sounds a little bit better, but paletas y plática. So basically what I am doing is we're notifying schools that I will be within the area. And Alicia and myself, and and sometimes um, Mr. Berman or um, Brenda Guzman is going to be coming with me so that we have a couple um, people and it will be my opportunity to be around families that don't necessarily come to conventional meetings. So, you know, we have a subset of parents that come to our parent leader meetings, but we also have another subset of parents that don't. And so this will hopefully allow us to be able to access those parents. Um, if these were Work out well, so we have um, five right now scheduled. But if these work out well, then we'll expand that and we'll go to more areas and, and more locations. But these are pretty walkable locations, and so um, I look forward to being able to be out and listen to our students and families um, within their neighborhoods. So um, thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Next, we'll move to item 3.4 governing board comments. Uh, and reports on standing committees. We'll start with um, Jennifer Holm, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. So I attended the uh, Innovator of the Year Awards for uh, Paro Valley Education Foundation, where we recognized the innovative classified and certificated staff uh, throughout the district. And I also attended several graduations and promotions. So congratulations to everyone who is starting a new chapter next academic year. And I also met with a representative from Robert Rivas's office and also with Son Senator John Laird to advocate for funding in the budget proposal that will support the work we are doing in public education. So that's it. Thank you. Trustee Soto. Yeah, you'll my comments this evening. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Orozco. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Um, I just want to start off my comments by congratulating our high school graduates, and I'm wishing their my very best on what their future endeavors are. Um, I did attend the Innovator of the Year. It was nice to um, recognize both classific our classified and certificate employees. We recognized over 100 employees. Um, so it was a very lovely event. It's always nice to see not only our employees, but um, families uh, celebrating uh, with them. I do want to extend my gratitude to our executive assistants. I know that they invested a lot of their time and energy in putting together and helping with the Innovator of the Year Awards. Um, so thank you to all of them. Um, I also uh, got the opportunity to attend, this was a while back, um, at the grand opening of our wellness um, center. 
Um, so I think that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Shocker. Thank you. So I also attended Innovator of the Year Awards with some of our fellow board members. So congratulations to all our innovators. Um, we're lucky to have many of our, our staff and teachers um, as innovators in this district. I also attended the grand opening of our wellness center. And that was great to see some community members there, some children who go to the wellness center were also present and gave a tiny little speech so that was really um, nice to see how excited they are about having that in their community um, attended as many promotions and graduations as I could um, made sure that I got visit into all my school sites the last um, weeks of school so it was very busy last couple of weeks also didn't get to mention last time because I was on zoom um, I, we had the DALAC end of the year meeting with our parents and they showed their gratitude by um, giving us some beautiful hearts. So that was really a nice um, gesture on that. So thank you, parents and families. And last but not least, congratulations to all our students and families on the next chapter that you move on to. And thanks to all of our teachers and staff for your hard work this year. Thank you. Thank you. Um, like some of my colleagues, I did attend uh, multiple graduations. I think we had, um, I had five graduations on one day, including Aptos High, PV High, um, Aptos Junior High, and my, my favorite graduation uh, every year is the post-secondary graduation of our special ed students, which is just so very touching. If you've never been to that graduation, it's unbelievably beautiful so anyway so thank you to the special ed department for making that so awesome for those uh, young graduates um, in the past couple of weeks I've also like um, many of the trustees have attended the innovator of the year where we honored 104 exemplary um, uh, teachers and staff and thank you very very much for your excellent work and your compassion um, I I attended the Queer Youth Awards and Happy Pride Month to all of our um, families and students who identify as queer. Um, that was a beautiful night in Watsonville, hosted this year, and, and I was very proud of the way the campus looked and how it was set up. It was just really great, um, despite the high-speed car chase that, that <laughs> and the helicopter circling the campus during the awards. That was a bummer, but other than that, it was a beautiful night. Um, we met with Edward James Olmos with the Youth Cinema Project and saw a bunch of unbelievable films at the Mellow Center and we, we thank him so much for um, funding the work that we do here with the students. It's just, uh, and I'm hoping we can get some of those um, films up on, um, on our website if possible because they're really cool. So it was, it was an honor to meet him and spend time with him. And it was an honor to see all the films and, and to celebrate our students with their families. So thank you for to those of you who were able to make that. Attending graduations, um, serving on committees is one of the duties um, of a board trustee. And if, if um, there are a couple of uh, trustees who don't serve on any committees and who don't attend any of these events, and I would just say that I wish you would because it's a it, it's very touching and it's beautiful and it makes you feel like all of this is worthwhile. These long hours that we put in and the hard decisions that we make, it's very, a very important duty of a board trustee to serve on a committee or multiple committees and to attend these these beautiful events for our students. So. That's uh, what I'll say about that. If anybody here tonight would like to speak on any of the agenda items, I'm sorry I was remiss to say this earlier on, please get a yellow card in the back and you can give it to Ava, who's sitting here on the end taking notes and um, it'll get down to us and we'll call your name um, with the appropriate agenda item. Also, if you need interpretation tonight, we do have an interpreter sitting here. What's her name? Orania. Orania, I'm sorry, I can never remember your name, Orania. I'm gonna write it down next time, but thank you for being here. Um, and with that, we'll move to item 4.1, approval of our agenda. I need a motion. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? 
Great. The motion carries. Um, next, we'll have approval of our minutes from May 25th, 2022. I, I move, move to, to approve. approve. Oh, I'll uh, second. First and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Five, is it zero, two. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to item 6.1, public hearing. This is a draft of our 2022 local control accountability plan and presented tonight by our, our assistant superintendent, um, Lisa Aguirre. Thank you, good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm honored this evening to present the draft 2022-23 local control and accountability plan. Um, this is the second year in the three-year plan that was approved uh, last June. Um, in putting together the plan, we took in a lot of input, and we also had the opportunity to walk through data from this past year as our students returned. So I almost think of when we look at doing the update of the LCAP plan almost in three phases. Uh, the first phase is the launch. Um, where we and that happens around February um, we open we start talking with our parent engagement network team to talk about the different ways that we're going to engage our parent and guardian and community to figure out what's the best way each year we try different um, different things to reach out to more parents and guardians to get as much input as possible um, conversations with the superintendent happen all year long but during this time and on um, Dr. Rodriguez, when she meets with staff, looks and asks them the questions on what are some things that are going well and some things that we need to um, change to support our students. Um, we launched the Thought Exchange, and the Thought Exchange is the um, platform that we use to um, get community input, and where also um, members that go on it can give ratings, which we'll discuss in a little bit. Um, and then I also engage with two parent advisory groups and then during this time, I was here in front of you presenting the mid-year LCAP report in February and to, give, um, to talk about some of our metrics and the action items and the budgetary items. Phase two, March to April, continue to meet with um, parent advisory group, reviewed some of the initial feedback that we had received through the thought exchange as well as um, from our parent engagement network and also um, when we're meeting with uh, parent groups, not all of them are capable, not all parents and guardians are capable of or want to use the thought exchange. So with the input that we gather, whether it's by written hand, um, our parent engagement team does an amazing job of reaching out to parents to make sure everybody has their thoughts. Um, held bilingual community meetings um, and then worked to align services and needs with our expanded learning grant. Um, that's when we started looking at how where the expanded learning grant came in with our community, um, what they're saying about the expanded learning grant and making sure that we're aligning and matching the services so there's no duplicate of services and that we're really thoughtfully um, putting in um, services for the needs of our students. Um, phase three, May to June, um, met with student groups. This was a lot of fun because it was in person this year. And then uh, finalized the draft of the LCAP plan. And then um, tonight is the public review of the LCAP plan. And then um, also we have the LCAP plan where public can still give um, some review or input or questions on it on our website, which I'll give that link in a little bit. So the Thought Exchange survey, um, this year we had 944 online participants, but including other participants who didn't do the Thought Exchange, we had roughly 1,200 um, people who participated to give us feedback with the LCAP. Um, with the Thought Exchange, we had over 1,000 thoughts with over 23,000, close to 24,000 ratings. This is where um, uh, you're able to go in and rate other people's thoughts. Some of the committee, um, meet the committee groups that I met with um, and the parent, we met with the district advisory committee, the DAC, um, this, we met with them twice, the migrant parent advisory committee, the district English language advisory committee, the DLAC, district SELPA, parent engagement network, and then we had elementary and secondary student focus groups, so we also make sure that we included the elementary, and then three community, the bilingual community LCAP input sessions. 
The question that was asked um, was, as we plan for the upcoming school year and beyond, what are the most important things our district needs to think about to support students? We had lots of plans in place, um, and we just didn't know how everything would pan out when students returned this year. So this was our opportunity to say, did we get it right? And a lot of it we did get right. Um, and what are some of the things that we might need to adjust? Uh, the words in front of you, the larger the words, the more those words appeared in the thought exchange. So bathrooms, qualified, usually followed by staff, um, food, um, and then environment. Those were the, 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 some of the words that were um, put in over and over. So these are the key thoughts. These are the overall key thoughts, looking at all the different subgroups and all the different categories. After this, I'll break it down into the different um, subgroups as well as the categories. Um, so the top key thoughts, um, we need to make sure students feel safe using bathrooms at their schools. Bathrooms need to be updated and or monitored regularly. This is something, a reoccurring thing that we have had, uh, that we have heard at some board meetings. And then we need to have a teacher in each classroom. This is also a reoccurring theme that we've heard. And then um, last night, I think it's extremely important to have Spanish language electives and Spanish for Spanish speakers offered in our junior high and our middle schools. So when we look at the different subgroups, the first one with the students, um, students had a lot to say. Um, per with the number of participants versus the number of thoughts, they had the highest ratio, so they gave us the most thoughts per um, per participant. Uh, field trips, um, better food options came up quite a bit. Um, feminine products should be in the bathrooms. This was also a recurring theme. Um, teaching kids about the real world and the problems they will face after they graduate is so important. Have languages available to take, so this goes along with the other thought. And then I strongly dislike desks that have chairs attached. This was um, given in multiple ways. Of I, it's hard for me to get into the desk when the chairs are attached. Parent, garden, family members. Um, we need to make sure students feel safe using bathrooms. I think it's important to have the Spanish language. Um, do I saw? Please continue to support the advanced classes. Committed credential teachers who hold students accountable. Improve facilities and grounds um, with facilities. And then the curriculum that my student uses is not challenging and some of his teachers are not up to date with effective teaching strategies. The top key thoughts for staff. Uh, we need to have a teacher in each classroom. Uh, increase the salary for teachers and staff. Teacher prep periods need to be restored. We need to, we need all teaching assignments filled. Uh, continue to hire and maintain qualified staff for the sake of our students and full-time social emotional counselors. Community members, uh, facilities, uh, continue to keep the goals of the equity audit. Ensure safety of students. Start preschool sp programs in Spanish and e not and not English, uh, more tutoring for students in the AP classes, keep all fruit and vegetables organic for improved health outcomes with the food. So now breaking down into the different categories, um, career, college career and life readiness, which is our LCAP goal number one. Make sure academic level is strong and high in the area so that um, students are able to compete with students throughout the region. Teaching kids about the real world. Um, more academic resources geared towards sciences, math, and technology. Balance with the art focus. And then resources for struggling students. How are we accelerating struggling students? Class offerings. Um, this We already saw one about the Spanish. Um, please continue to support the advanced classes, the AP. High school advisory period could incorporate more advisory type development. Um, and so what they're talking about is not just homework help, but introduce study skills and time management, um, making sure all students have access to classes and the opportunities that they need. Professional development, this category, we need uh, to do a better job of teaching students how to write. Um, I feel like teachers should check on students when they see them nervous or uncomfortable, and I think they should, should make a better track, um, which means that moving around within the classrooms. I'm assuming, um, have students that care about, having teachers that care about students, and then quality teachers ratings on performance rather than tenure. School connectedness and um, positive culture, regulations about cell phone use during class, um, 
one of the things that we did notice that students, they were used to having their cell phones with them when they're in distance learning. And so the attachment to the learning and coming back to class, they were used in different ways. Safety at school, reduced violence, providing a safe and productive environment, field trips and having a safe and caring environment. Facilities, um, there was lots of thoughts on facilities. Um, some of the things, in a lot of it with the bathrooms or the desks. Um, so the first one's the bathrooms, and improves the facilities and grounds, and then the bathrooms, and then the, the desks and chairs. And so there were some on the key thoughts. So these was just uh, uh, looking at the different thoughts that came across the different groups, and then based um, on the different LCAP areas. So the draft LCAP, um, the major change this year is the eighth goal, which is, um, so the, the first eight, the first seven goals are the same. Um, and the eighth goal, the, the additional goal is the support for students with disability. Um, and this goal we put in because it's required by ed code based on PBUSD's reoccurring um, eligibility for differentiated assistance. Um, the eligibility for differenti differentiated assistance um, under the California systems is if you have a student subgroup that is read in two or more categories on the 2019 um, California dashboard, then we go into differentiated assistance. This subgroup, the students with disability, we were in the red with English language arts, math, um, suspensions, and graduation rate. And so because of this, we had to add a goal specifically for students with disability, and that's the eighth goal that's placed in there. The um, LCAF draft, some of the action highlights, these are actions that um, either that are new or that there's gonna be a focus or ones that we didn't get to implement for this school year. So in goal number one, the continued focus on early literacy, um, we, we saw that through, we did, a, we did a great job in distance learning when teaching, trying to te teaching students with early literacy and how to read, but it's not the same when you're sitting in front of a student as a teacher, um, and so filling those gaps. Um, culturally responsive classroom and teaching. Um, this goes with all of our staff, from our teachers, our administrators, and our support staff. Um, AP course access and support. That's one of the um, outcomes within the equity audit, and it's something that we need to focus on is how do we increase access um, for students at the high school level. And then our multi tiered systems of support. Uh, we believe if we have a strong multi-tiered systems of support, students who are struggling, we can at first put in um, different assistance for those students before we just give up on the students and some students do as we know think differently and that this way allows us to find out which students might need something different than what's happening in the traditional classroom to help support them in their academics. Um, goal two, career techni technical education. Um, a new action is pilot and build engineering and engineering technology pathways. That should say Watsonville High School, on the D's there. Watsonville High School, Aptos High School, PV High School, and New School. So this is one that we are going to be building out. And for goal three, it's the Save the Music expansion. We're adding four schools this year. We're adding Ansoldo, Valencia, Rio Del Mar, and Ohlone. Um, this is in addition to the ones that we have in place, which is Mesty, Calabasas, Bradley, Hall, H.A. Hyde, and McQuitty. Goal four, basic school conditions. Um, this is a very important goal, um, but it is the basic schools with making sure that we have appropriate credentials, we have the instructional materials and the facilities. Um, and so the school libraries is one of the ones that we added last year and we're gonna continue to focus and build on our school libraries so students have a place during school and after the school day. Uh, goal five, or uh, support and accelerate English language learners and their academics. Um, we're adding the International Academy at Watsonville High School. Um, and then also we've added additional um, English language development teachers at some secondary school sites. Goal six, the safe and supportive um, school site, uh, schools, um, the climates. 
We've increased the number of social emotional counselors and the mental health clinicians this year. Um, and within it, we're gonna continue to monitor our students' needs. Um, and then the clubs and social activities, extra work assignments for our school staff. Because of some of the COVID restrictions, we were not able to fully implement the additional clubs and social activities. And so this year, there's gonna be a large focus on making sure that we have money set aside for extra work assignments for our um, staff so that we can um, run the uh, clubs and social activities. And then for goal seven, um, one of the items that we were not able to do this past year that we're gonna have focus are family engagement plans. We're asking all school sites to complete a family engagement plan on what are the different ways that we are, that we are going to um, partner with um, our parents and guardians to making sure that they're, we have um, empowered education with the families and it's more of a partnership. And then for goal eight, um, both the actions are new because it is a new goal. First one, support personnel for students with um, disabilities. This is the cost for um, the support personnel that we have within the, the classrooms. And then the second action is the inclusive instructional setting expansion with push in support services for students so that they are in the, um, for our students to be in the least restrictive environment. So those are some of the highlights. The um, draft 2022-23 uh, LCAP is up on the, the website. And so if you, on our main web page, there is a place where you can click onto where it says draft LCAP. Um, and then on the draft LCAP, it'll take you to the draft LCAP that's both in English and Spanish. And then if any community members would like to um, ask questions or provide input, then um, you click the button on questions feedback about the draft, draft LCAP and then that goes, um, goes in and then I receive the questions and I will be responding. And what's next? I'm here for the public hearing and then um, at our next board meeting we take it for, um, for board approval. Thank you. And I heard my timer. <laughs> I th yeah, I thought he. I thought he was timing you. That's funny. <laughs> do we ha do we have any um, public speakers to this? We do. Agenda? We have two. We have um, Laura Hasado and Chris Webb. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, and everybody here on the board. It's nice to see you. And Lisa, I, I want to commend you on this report because I read through a lot of this L, 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 LCAP control accountability and it's, it's very involved. It's very involved. Um, so I'm Laura Azaro and I'm with H.A. Hyde Elementary School. I'm a reading intervention teacher. And I was, I am here to address the possibility of reading intervention teachers being pulled from elementary schools to fill positions that are not filled yet for next year. And this LCAP report took an incredible amount of time and energy and incorporated lots and lots of stakeholders as you can see. And the highlights of this report indicate that English language learners, I mean, one of the goals is to provide a multi-tiered system to support our students at all of the schools. <coughs> we have base funding for it. We got, we received extra funding for it for three years. Uh, additional reading intervention teachers were hired. Additional classified staff was hired. And I'm happy to report anecdotally and through our maps, our NWA map data, of which is one of the data points that we use to see how we did this year after the horrific loss from last year, is that it's working. We have a very tight multi-tiered system. Working really hard on it and it's been difficult to implement at times because of how much is involved. The multi-tiered approach, um, the different reports that we fill out for the students during the year to make sure they're meeting goals, the ones that are falling behind. Um, it would just, 
be ashamed to see people that are working so closely to our students for the last two years disappear Thank you. Uh, in order to solve a problem that there might be other options for. Thank you, Laura. Hi, Chris. Hi. Uh, I wanted to thank the district for their um, their thought exchanges. I feel like that's a really meaningful way to get everybody's involvement. And then I also want to thank Dr. Rodriguez for even besides that doing the uh, the Q and A's. Again, I, I I hear from all different staff, and they they do seem to uh, take those to heart and appreciate it. Um, a couple of things that I heard Renaissance students like in person say that I saw echoed. I don't know if they did the thing or not, but they definitely do want a Spanish teacher, like a real person, not ingenuity. Um, also, um, the field trips, like uh, that's we had some success with that this year. Well, just historically we have, but then again this year, and um, we used to way back in the day, um, pre-COVID. Uh, you could to have like a big trip or have have more capacity. S teachers would sometimes employ their personal vehicle, you know, doing all the paperwork and everything. Um, I'm not sure if COVID nicks that, but I I would hope that that could be uh, restored because I do have teachers coming to me saying like, hey, I want to be a part of your next one. Um, and then a couple of things for goal four for Renaissance, we still need a long-term um, water solution where we like not just the two ROs, but like where every tap that I wash my hands out of has trustworthy water, so Cole Creek Water District, ideally, connect with them. And then goals six, seven, and eight, I thought every single one of those would be uh, served by our old, our, our previous award-winning system. We, you notice that they, part of the thing on here from a student, I think it was, was about accountability and standards. That goes with it. But then also there was all the opportunities it brought. And you know, if you want teachers to not be drained, they gotta feel supported. And I mean, the phone thing goes with that too. We need to make sure admin are gonna be confident enough to do their part on phones to support teachers. Thank you. Thank you. That was our last speaker. Okay. Um, <coughs> And next, we'll have any comments or questions from our board members. Jen, home. Hi there. Um, so I often get questions from my constituents about you know how like some of these decisions come to be, you know how projects get implemented, you know at one site or another or you know at all sites. And other than listening to these reports, which I encourage. Um, what would be the best way for members of the community to be involved in local decisions on a regular basis? If they are a member of their um, of a school community where they are in, um, have students on the community, I would say is to attend the meeting school site council or attend parent meetings to get their input. Um, there's also some schools that offer coffee with the super, uh, coffee with the principal, and so that's another opportunity. Um, if they are not part of the school and they're part of the school community, it's making sure that their voices are heard as we do the thought exchange and we hold the um, community meetings throughout the year. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jen Shocker. I just wanted to say that um, I liked that we were able to do some online things um, this year with the LCAP, and I think that helps parents' participation. Um, and I was really happy to hear how much student participation we had, because after all, we're here for the students, so hearing their input and really invokes what changes we need to be made. And you know, we've heard, like you said, at board meetings that some of these things on the LCAP are the goals of the community and students, so um, I think you did a great job in, in putting this together, and I definitely support our moving forward on a lot of these. Thank you. Trustee Rosco, do you have any comments? Mm -hmm. No? Okay, I have a couple of questions. They're a little bit granular, so I apologize, but you said something about um, on the goal around school libraries. 
you said something about build out and I'm wondering what is planned for the build out of our school libraries so when I said build out it's in two ways it's looking at the library collection to making sure so some of our um, library collections were antiquated and so we're, ma we're looking at the average um, like the average what is it age average age of the the books that are in the mm -hmm. and then also we look at the average um, reading level and then we look at that based on the school level it's at so that's one thing is making sure that our library collections are up to date the second thing is we're looking at to making sure that there are spaces within the library so that students can have a collaborative space or they can have um, individual areas um, Rolling Hills is a, a great example right now where she uh, the librarian was um, one of our innovators of the year did an amazing and beautiful job um, in adding a maker space and adding really looking at having a collaborative individual and you can do even a litter um, a lit circle within the library and so it's just making them more up to date um, so when I'm talking about build out we're looking at the individual as we go along we wanted to start with our um, <coughs> secondary school sites because we had we need more spaces for students to attend after school for their um, tutoring and having a space where they feel like they want to be and and not where it's just a that's great. I know that some of our libraries have been updated and others have, and it would be great to actually, let's put this on the agenda as a report in about what, you know, the, all the junior highs look like with pictures, what is planned, how much is allocated. I think that would be a great presentation in the future. Um, and then you said something about adding an international academy to Watsonville High. Yes. Can you, I know maybe that's been presented before. I don't really remember the detail on that though. Can you talk about what that is and? Mm -hmm. So the International Academy is um, for students who are new to our country, who've been here within 24 months. And so what it is is extra support services for both the students and the families. We currently have the program at Rolling Hills Middle School. And um, this past year, we've seen an increase in the number of students who are um, newcomers are new to our, our, our country and so because of this we wanted to add the services at uh, the high school and so Watsonville High School was our um, choice of where this program going goes into it's not just um, available to students who are at Watsonville High School so if you are a student and you're within the Pajo Valley High School um, attendance area uh, we do provide bus services if you qualify for the program and your family um, wants you to be part of it families it's not required for families to be part of the International Academy and it is a family choice choice thanks for um, the clarification on that that's really lovely um, years ago uh, Catholic Charities used to run a group and have services for newcomer families and we used to fund part of that it was a very small contribution like five thousand dollars and at some point when we got into budget problems we cut that funding to them It'd be really nice to include some stakeholder partners in the community who are also serving that same um, population so I would encourage us to look for those um, champions out there in the community to help with this um, great idea we have I was just going to can I say the family engagement and wellness center sure. is a great connection and mm -hmm. so our um, counselor who will help support students and their families will um, look for the services within the community as well that's great um, you said something else um, that I had a question about push in support services, I think, for, for students with disabilities. Yes. So, um, students with disabilities um, in the in the ver there's pull out where students are segregated and separated from the rest of the class push in if students um, push in services is where students would attend a general education classroom sometimes students depending on where they are um, may need um, an adult um, instructional associate or somebody else to attend the class with them to, to whatever supports are needed sometimes it is um, it can be anywhere from like a differentiation in that and when there are assignment that's being asked of them but the push in is that students aren't separated and instead they are with students in a general education classroom so I could be a student who qualifies for SDC services but my math level is actually um, higher so I would go to if I was in middle school I would go to a general education classroom for my math but it doesn't mean that I could survive on my own and I might need um, someone to go with me or I might make need to make sure that I have a, a a calculator or something else that I would need so that I am um, supported within the um, classroom general education environment and so this would be the least restrictive environment because um, yeah it is yeah 
So we're going to be funding um, extra. We already aids. fund. No, so this is in. we um, we fund. So within it, we fund the aids, um, and this is we're not adding additional aids. Um, we add um, personnel or services based on students' individual needs, which are in the IEP. Um, which is a team decision and so we don't add so anything. we're just simply then calling out something we're already doing but we're not it's not an ad correct in any way. so we're it's okay. services that we're already doing correct. okay then my next question sorry to interrupt you um, the next question is about I know we get concentration grants for foster youth um, concentration funds yeah co sorry concentration yeah. funds mm -hmm. for the fo for foster kids and I'm not sure we've had a report recently about what how much money is being spent on that particular group and what the outcomes have been um, so maybe that can go on the agenda too and for future yeah what we can do is we've been asked during the data special board study session mm -hmm. to do subgroups so That's, we'll make okay, sure perfect. that foster youth is included on that data set that's that great. sound good? Yeah, and I'd like okay. to talk to him potentially in that, well, I don't know if this is the right, but you said something about we're in the red for, for children with, dis, students with disabilities and foster kids for suspensions, expulsions, and something else. It was else. just students with disabilities? She, she didn't okay. mention foster. Yeah. We, we are in the red with foster, but for the students with disabilities, we have it. It's from the 2019 California dashboard. Oh, uh-huh. Okay. Um, because then uh, the CASP testing was suspended. And so the metrics um, will are, it's one of the metrics and it shows it's broken down by subgroups mm -hmm. um, within um, goal one and also goal five. And so we do make sure that we break down the subgroups as well. And so in the meeting, the data meeting when we come into August, um, we will. Okay, yeah, it'd be great to hear more about that and help to understand better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions from board members? Um, with that, I'll close this public hearing. Thank you, Lisa. Um, next is Mr. Clint Rucker, our um, Chief Business Officer, who will be presenting on the 2022-2023 proposed budget and the 2021-2022 estimated actuals. Thank you, President. This, is, this Board is also, of I'm sorry, this is a public hearing as yes. well. So, sorry, I need to open the public hearing. Thank you. <laughs> you may proceed. <laughs> Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So, what a year it's been. I mean, we're already back in June doing another budget, and um, I'm excited. I do love doing budgets, but I thought I would share a little fun picture. This is my wife and I on a roller coaster, which is about how I felt this year has been and also how this budget process has been. Typically, the budget process is a little bit no more normalized. This year, it's just it's been nothing but craziness. I think the last week I've spent probably about 30 hours just reading different budget documents, seeing what people are saying, seeing what the legislature wants to do versus the governor. So it's been quite the experience. So go ahead and jump into it. So we are going to talk about the May revise because, again, that is the budget that the governor actually proposed back in May. We didn't do an update because we were going to share it today. So I'll start there. So in the actual May revision, um, this is what we had that was new from what we saw actually in January. So we saw a 6.56 cost of living adjustment. That's the statutory COLA. So that's what's owed to the district, regardless of what the governor wants to do with any additional funds. That is what's actually owed to the district. Very nice to see that they are including special education. There's often times that we see special education isn't included in that full COLA. They are included in the full COLA. We see a 5.38 COLA in 23-24 and a 4% COLA in 24-25. So those of you who have been following budgets for a long time know that those are pretty high COLA numbers to see three years in a row. So exciting to see that in the budget, exciting to see that the governor um, is putting that money towards schools. Again, statutory COLA is required by Prop 98, so it means the state's doing very well right now. Um, we also saw pro the proposed declining enrollment relief, which was seen in January. That's that average to kind of smooth out that transition as we see declining enrollment each year. We also saw a brand new proposal in the May revision, which was ADA relief specifically for 21-22. So recognizing that statewide, we're down about 6% in ADA across the state. So pretty significant drop from what we normally see. So just giving us a quick 
dartboard projection. If we, you see up above, that's January 2022. That's what we used to have in uh, at first interim. That's what we had, and at second or at second interim, excuse me. And then May 2022. So this is the May revised. We see those new cola numbers coming in. So increases across the board. See about a 1.3 increase in 22-23, almost a 2 percent or just over a. 2%, no, just under 2% in 23, 24, and then just a slight increase in 24, 25. So declining enrollment relief, let's talk about that really quick. What does that look like for our district? So what, what the proposal is, is that beginning in 22, 23, right now the district has two options for calculating our average daily attendance for funding. So our ADA, our actual funded ADA. One is that we can use our current ADA for the year, or we can use last year's ADA. Typically, if you're declining in enrollment, you're always using last year's ADA because it's higher. If you're increasing in students, you're using current year ADA. That's always for, since I've been in school, is the only way that the state has allowed you to use ADA. So actuals from 22-23 or our actual ADA from 21-22. They are now adding a new option, which is our average ADA based on the prior three years. So similar to what we do with our unduplicated percentage, they're saying, knowing that the state is in declining enrollment, we want to smooth that decline. You'll probably all remember me talking about 22, 23, having that cliff, that ADA cliff, where we kind of lose the hold harmless. This is kind of changing it from a cliff to more of a slope. So now it's slowly, we continue to see that decline, but it doesn't hit us all in one year. So what would that look like for us using this type of model? So you see our ADA from 29, uh, 2019, 20, 2021, all the way through 22, 23. We did have that hold harmless, which is why our 19, 20 and our 2021 actually were pretty high. And then our 21, 22, you see that big drop. drop. That's because of that. We didn't quite get a 6%. We did see about a 4 to 5% decrease in our normal ADA. And then you see that actually 22, 23, we expect would have been higher even though we're declining enrollment because we expect ADA to get better as we kind of move away. Again, a lot of that, not our fault, right? We had quarantines that were, were required by the state, wasn't something that we were wanting. But again, we are also encouraging families, if you have sick children, we don't want to spread the virus. We don't want people in school when they're sick. So again, a noticeable decrease in 21, 22, but understandable why. So using that average, we would actually take the average of that 1920 through 2122, and you would see that current law, we'd be picking 2223, our current year, because that would actually be slightly higher. But using this average, we'd actually be able to pick the 16124. So we'd actually see an increase of about 900 ADA. And I highlighted that. It wasn't actually highlighted originally, and I'm highlighting it for a reason, and I'll get back to it. Just remember that 942 number. So the governor's May revision had another proposal in it. So this proposal was what everyone's, everyone in our world has been referring to as the attendance yield solution. So what he said is we recognize that in 21-22 you had historically low ADA. So you can see our ADA in 21-22 is 90.82%. In 19-20, which was about our last normal year, we can look at right now, 94.63%. So about a 4% drop. So what the governor recognized is that 90.82 percentage really isn't accurate as to what probably would happen in a normal year. Typically to get to that percentage, you take your ADA, you divide it by your enrollment, that's your percentage. What the governor has said we could do for 21-22 is actually say, take your old ADA percentage and multiply that by your enrollment to actually come up to your ADA. So rather than using your actual ADA, use what you normally would get in a percentage and multiply it. Now, I don't expect the board to remember all of this or understand all of how to calculate it. Just want to show the transparency of what the governor's kind of been pro proposing. Now, um, using just this model, you could see that our ADA for 21-22 would go from 15074 up to 15669 so about a 595 ADA increase. So to make it more confusing, the governor decided, well, it's not enough to give you ADA relief and give you an average. You actually use the ADA relief when you calculate your average. So now we have an ADA relief on top of our average. So to do the funding calculation, Colleen and I worked together and we sat there and Colleen actually got a video of me doing it. I was trying to get down the numbers and how it all works. It was actually a lot more confusing than we thought it would be. I'm the worst part, too, is we actually reached out to the COE, and I'm like, hey, we're doing this. This is how we think it's done. What do you think? They're like, you're the only district who's actually putting in the work to do that calculation. And I'm like, oh, Leanne, should I not be doing it? She goes, no, it's great that you're doing it. She goes, I'm just surprised that our biggest district is actually putting in the work to do the math. So um, 
a lot of fun actually doing it. Um, we got to kind of use the, unfortunately, normally you use the LCFF calculator to put in, and so it does the calculations, and you can ensure that what you're doing is correct. Unfortunately, the LCFF calculator always wants to take the greater of the prior or the current year, so you can't actually do the average because it'll always end up picking the current year because that average will keep going up or the prior year. So we actually had to do it manually, but um, we, we did end up going through and doing it manually. So we use that 21-22 with the ADA relief, that 15669, and then we took the average based on 1920 and 2021. So we actually averaged it out to get our new average ADA for this year. We also did that for that two out years as well. We calculated out that average each year. So again, quite confusing. I don't expect you to fully you know, re remember it. And also I will put in this caveat, legislature actually says we want to do away with that ADA relief. So we did all this math and all this work, and now the legislature is like, well, let's not use that ADA relief. So we're going to probably end up at 45 days seeing a different number coming through. But what you see is it would have been an 1140 increase. Realistically, if we take out that relief, it's going to be a, still about a 900 increase, that 942 you saw earlier. So just know, I think the big takeaway is there is ADA relief proposed in May, as well as declining enrollment protection. When you combine them, we could see anywhere between 900 to 1,100 more ADA, so which is great for us. Um, I will say that the legislature budget that proposes removing this ADA relief does propose using that money to increase the COLA. So it's actually not a bad thing for us, and budget, budgetarily, it will not be a decrease for us. If anything, we'd see an increase from that. So getting into multi-year, just to again clarify, these are based on that ADA relief and that declining enrollment protection. So again, just, that, just for transparency, that's how we built it out. Um, you can see our beginning balance. We do see a big decrease in 22-23. That is spending down a lot of one-time money. We did have one-time funding that we spent down, so that is where you see that. In 23-24, that decrease actually goes down significantly to about 477000 and then you'll see that spike back up in 24, 25, and you might ask, well, how's it go back up? We're continually getting coal as well. Two things, one, that kind of ADA cliff we talk about, well, they've pushed it back to 24, 25. So we're see still seeing kind of that big drop in the revenues. The other big piece that we're seeing too is all of the one-time positions that we added using our ESSER funding. So that's the IAs, our reading intervention teachers, virtual academy teachers. We also had social emotional supports, mental health clinicians, a lot of great things we did for students. And I know the board wants to find a way to continue those. So being that we know there's a 45 day revision coming, this is going to change drastically. We didn't want to make any drastic decisions and talk to the board about where do we reduce if we want to reduce that deficit spending, because I think it's premature to do that until we actually see what comes from the government office. Unfortunately, with school finance, we have this odd cart before the horse. Build a budget even though you don't have the governor's budget to actually build a budget off of. You have nothing signed. So we're doing the best we can with the information we have, but we know it changes. And this year in particular has been a very strange year. And some of the differences, which I'll get to later, from the legislature's office are it's a little insane to see what they're proposing versus what's in the budget. Normally we see very small differences. We see the legislature sticking their heels in on a small amount of money for the entire state. Right now they're sticking their heels in about really big dollars and we'll kind of get into what that looks like. So just to always go through, we always do look at our contributions. You'll see contributions. Our special ed contribution continues to stay pretty steady. Um, they are getting a COLA, which helps it from increasing. But again, as they do get that COLA, they do see increased costs as well. And in 24, 25, um, that extra jump is due to the, some of those positions that we added for special education as well that were one-time positions that would end up coming off the books, off of general fund and into, or off of our restricted and back into our general fund. Restricted routine maintenance based on our expenditures. That's why it ends up going up. Our scholarship is, as always, our personnel commission is generous enough to donate their what would normally be their stipends to a scholarship, so we actually move that to a separate fund. Um, DTI does have a uh, contribution. It's one of our only charters that does. They are working on reducing that. Um, they were, of course, hit hard by COVID as well. They're getting some ADA support in the budget, in the new budget, and hopefully, um, I know that Marcy has been at it, you know, very. Um, very passionately advocating for students and trying to get her numbers up, so she's hoping to work that down as well. And then Healthy Start, you might wonder why it's coming off the books in 24, 25, when we've had it for so many years. This is really just an accounting 
um, process. Typically, we have employees who do work for Healthy Start, but we have them, to make them full-time employees, we also have them do some work that's really more general fund activities. So we end up contributing to Healthy Start to say we'll pay for our share of those employees. We're going to actually start coding them 50-50 or 40-60, depending on what they are. So you won't see a con contribution, but that's one of those other reasons you see general fund go up a little bit. So what's not in our budget that was included in the May revise? So as we're looking through the May revise, one thing I want to remind the board and one thing that we hear a lot from the COE when we're talking with them is the May revision is a proposal, it's not law. So everything in this budget, other than the statutory COLA, which pretty consistently is what it is, is a proposal by the governor. The legislature is then going to take that proposal, look at it, and propose their own budget. They'll meet again, and then they'll sign off on a budget. So some things we didn't include. The big three really were the additional COLA of 3.3%. So again, that's not a statutory COLA. That was a governor's proposal. The one-time discretionary block grant, which was proposed by the governor, we didn't include that, and I'll get into the reasons in a little bit. And then the facilities funding that we've heard about. Um, there's a, over three years funding provided for facilities. And then the unknown we also didn't include. So one-time ELOP infrastructure funding. This was first brought in in May revised. There's been very little information about it. We don't know how the funding would be allocated. We don't know if it's by ADA. We don't know if it's an application process. So we did not include that. Um, TK add-on funding. This is, again, a brand new proposal in May revised. We don't know if it'll pass through the legislature. It does offer an additional 2800 per TK ADA. So great news for us for our TK going towards universal TK. However, it's unclear if the legislature will actually support that. And then lastly is the transportation grant. That is simply because we never include the grants that are included in the budget because they are by application and you're not guaranteed the money. Even though this one is, the governor is planning to guarantee a set amount per school, you still do need to apply and ensure that you actually qualify. So let's talk about the big three first. So the LCFF funding proposal, you can see these are the three that actually, um, when we looked at May Revise, this is what we are hearing. So the May revision included 2.1 billion for ongoing funding. That translated to that 3.3% COLA. That was part of it. Um, the assembly actually wanted a 15% total COLA. And they wanted to increase um, the number of students identified as low income by increasing the poverty level to 250% of the federal poverty level. And then the Senate wanted to do $5 billion of ongoing, growing to $10 billion. Well, we actually did see the legislature's proposal. They met with the Senate. They talked. And it looks like they're actually, their solution is 16.2% COLA and removing that ADA relief. So we won't see that ADA being able to use our old percentage for our average. We're just going to have to take our actual um, ADA for 21-22. Now, that being said, I can tell you doing quick math, a 16.2% COLA is much better than ADA relief because while the ADA relief is great for three years, that fourth year, that ADA relief goes away. That COLA doesn't go away unless they reduce it. So that COLA is ongoing. So we would actually love to see the legislature win over on this one and have the governor go with their proposal. Discretionary block grant. So the main reason we didn't put in the discretionary block grant is for us in finance, discretionary means discretionary. We spend it on whatever the board has determined the best use of those funds is. The assembly has said we want it to be a learning recovery block grant, and we don't specify an amount. They actually didn't know what that amount would be. And the Senate wanted um, a little bit more confusing of a formula that they spread it over for COVID-related learning recovery. What ended up happening, once again, is it seems like the Assembly and the Senate kind of met in the middle, and they're proposing $8.5 billion, so they are increasing it for something they're calling the Learning Loss Discretionary Block Grant, which honestly is one of the weirdest titles. It's, it's either a discretionary block grant or it's not. So a Learning Loss Discretionary Block Grant, it's a little odd. Sounds like they want it to go towards personnel um, as well as increases in PERS and STIRS. So we didn't put that in the budget because, again, we don't feel it's a fair um, representation of where those dollars are going to go if we don't know the parameters of where we can spend them. So to say we received, you know, for us, I would guess by quick math, over, just over $20 million. I don't want to put $20 million in revenue and say here's where I'm spending it just to find out that the, the governor ends up saying you can't spend it in any of those areas. So we did leave that out, but again, that's what our 45-day revision is for. And again, it's, it's a little bit odd of a budget where we'll see a lot of changes at that 45-day revise. 
And then lastly is facility funding. Um, one of the biggest pieces in facilities funding that I was excited about was the 1.7 billion of one-time money for deferred maintenance. So that's going towards our maintenance department to kind of do some of those ongoing repairs of our facilities, not necessarily brand new projects, but just ongoing repairs that we see with aging facilities is super valuable. Um, unfortunately, after the assembly and the Senate met, they did not go with the fully funding TK and child care. They actually went with pretty much what the Senate wanted to do in going with 4.5 billion. Um, they are not doing the TK and the deferred maintenance though. They're planning on doing 4.5 billion over four years instead of over three years. So again, more money for facilities, but not necessarily money for deferred maintenance. So we'll see how that pans out with the legislature and the governor on this one. I would hope we get a little bit closer to what the May revision is. It gives us more money immediately to work on facility, our aging facilities, as well as three years of facility funding. So what did, in looking at what did I find and when speaking with Colleen, what did we think and kind of agree on, what did we think was missing from the May revision? So what did we want to see that the governor did not include? So one is PERS and STRS pension relief. So the state's no longer subsidizing any pension increases. So as they increase, the district will be eating all of those costs. PERS is actually, um, for the first time in a long time, going to increase employee contributions for their new members. So you can kind of see how bad really the increases are being when they're actually pushing it off to members because they know it's such a large amount. Um, and we'll see some pretty significant increases in 22-23. Um, transportation funding, I'll get to that soon. That's one that um, I know when I learned about it and kind of saw how underfunded transportation was, it was a huge shock to me. And then unduplicated pupil percentage. I won't go into much detail on this one. I went into detail in January. This is where you see the universal meals coming through, which is, again, I can't express enough how great that is for our students to be able to get meals regardless of their um, their income at home to be able to get a free meal when they come to school. However, knowing that we use some of those applications for free meals to be able to determine eligibility for unduplicated pupils, how are we going to be able to continue to do that and emphasize to parents the importance of filling those out to get more funding for their schools and their students. And then ELOP funding allocations, which originally May Revise was considering taking it from a 2500 and a 1500 model. So any district that was over 80% unduplicated, like ourselves, would get 2500. Anyone below that would get 1500 per student. They, uh, the governor actually proposed doing 2,500 for all students, regard all districts, regardless of how many students they had in the unduplicated count. So while that's great for other districts, does not help us at all, and it's money spent that doesn't help us. The legislat uh, legislature is actually proposing increasing that 2,500 to 3,000. So we would actually see an increase in the legislature's proposal, not in the May revised. So we'll see how that one pans out as well. So just a quick look at our, what do our employer contribution rates look like? So you can see the big one in 22-23 is PERS going up about 2.4%. So about a 10% increase on PERS, pretty significant. STRS goes up about 2% as well, 2.2%, but they actually stay steady and it's projected that their rates are gonna stay steady all the way through 2046. So great news actually on that STRS side, with the exception of next year where we do see a pretty significant increase. So transportation funding. So transportation funding is severely underfunded. We talk a lot about how severely our special education department's underfunded and how it is at the federal level underfunded. Transportation actually has not changed their funding formula since I think it's 1983, 1987, around there. I mean, it's been, it's been over 30 years and they haven't changed it because they haven't required home to school transportation. So while we receive about $2.6 million in transportation funding, we spend about $11.2 million to transport the students we transport. Because we do transport a lot of our low income, our students that we know need to get to school. That's one of the priorities is making sure they get to school so they can be educated. So we do invest that much. The board has continued to support investing that much in transportation. What we are hearing is that the legislature is actually proposing a two point or $1.2 billion, and they're going to start requiring home to school transportation starting in 27 28. So what that'll mean is any TK6 will need to be transported as well as any low income students. So for us, while a lot of districts are looking at this and saying, oh God, how would we ever do this? For us, it's actually great news because we're doing a lot of this. 
we're providing a lot of these supports. It just means they'll finally be funding us on these. So again, fingers crossed, let's hope that the legislature wins out on this one because we could really use some transportation funding. And then what are some of our upcoming budget challenges? Um, again, no relief on the PERS and SIRS. Those continue to rise. So as we continue to do raises or we continue to hire staff, each time we're paying those statutories, those PERS and SIRS, and as those continue to rise, it now means PERS is almost going to be rather than about 35 cents on the dollar. So every time we spend a dollar, we actually spend 135. For PERS, it's going to be a closer to 40%. So that kind of hidden cost when we look at uh, salary and we say it's 50,000, we say, well, we've got to pay all the PERS on it. You have to add 40% to that. So it starts to really be significant. Um, we are continuing to see increases to health and welfare, um, specifically 22, 23, we're estimating around a 5% increase. I believe CISC has us estimated just below five right now, but again, that's their estimate. So we did estimate at 5%, and then the expiration of that ESSER funding. So you saw that third year where we kind of see that jump. One thing I do want to clarify is it may seem like, Clint, you're not very concerned about that ESSER funding expiring in that third year. I just don't want to count my chickens before they've hatched, right? I, I really want to look at what happens with the legislature's budget and what happens at our 45-day re revise. Let's see really what happens if we get that either that 3.3 additional COLA, if we get that 16.2 COLA, do they do the ADA relief? We have a lot of questions in the air right now that we want answered, but again, I'll be presenting that to the board. We will be doing a 45-day revision, and that'll be either July or August, depending on when the governor signs his budget and when we have to actually provide you with that 45-day revision. So then lastly, our next steps at the 22nd meeting. So in two weeks, we will be proposing this budget for adoption to the board. And then uh, the 45-day revise, which we're estimating right now, August 10th, we think, I mean, it will be pretty miraculous if the governor and legislature actually sign on, Jan on June 15th. Rarely ever see it done. They always seem to find a way to extend it and then get it right before they have to get paid in July. So. Um, then you'll see our unaudited actuals and then of course first interim kind of giving you an update of where we are. So just a note that August 10th is usually the special board study session for my evaluation. So what we would have to do is make it um, open session for the 45 day revise. We did this actually two years ago, um, 45 day revise at that meeting and then go into closed session at that point. So I just wanted to make that note in case later on you guys say, hey, that's not an actual um, regular board meeting. That is accurate. We would have to convert it to um, be partial open session. And then that's it. So I'm happy to hear questions from the public as well as the board. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item? Uh, we do not have speakers to this item. Okay, and questions from the board members? Jen Holm. Thank you, Clint, much appreciated. Um, so this is more of a statement than a question, um, but I think it's important that we as a board and the public be aware of what you know the current LCFF proposal means. And you know, when I was speaking to our state legislators uh, in the last couple of weeks, I spoke about the need for addressing like the COVID ADA pitfall better support for PERS and STIRS, you know, our retirement plans and fully funding the transportation proposals. And um, basically as the assembly, the Senate and the governor are wrangling out the final details, you know, we need to be aware that one school of thought is to have that larger LCFF, which covers some of the unfunded or partially funded mandates or to parse out funding to specific programs. And when things get finalized, we will just need to be mindful of what strings are attached and how those knots are tied. Um, this part is a question, and that is that when we get to the 45-day revision, um, just if you would please include um, in your report like how much of you know whatever the final you know LCFF is is how it's utilized by some of these unfunded or partially funded mandates. I would appreciate that. Absolutely, yeah, and um, just to speak that briefly, some of those, we've heard a lot about the community day schools. That unfortunately is one of the ones that would be unfunded in the legislature's mm -hmm. proposal because they're using some of that money, to your point, to fund their other proposals. So yep. absolutely, I'm happy to include that in the Thank presentation. You. Okay, of course I have a question. Of course. So it looks to me like we're going to get potentially a bucket full of extra money that we didn't have before, which is 
exciting and we have so many competing needs in this district, right? So my question for you, Clint, is can any of this extra money received be used for one time off salary allocation to teachers or staff? So under both proposals, both the uh, governor's current one as well as the legislature, yes, there is room to be able to use that one-time funding. Um, and if the board so wish to commit funding to salaries one time, we would be able to do that. We would, of course, have to negotiate it with our union, CSEA and PVFT, as every salary increase is negotiated. But if the board did want to use that funding for one-time increases, absolutely the funding would be able to be used for that. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think we're looking forward to hearing the proposed budget in 45. Yeah, because yeah, it's just, it's very confusing. I mean, I, I watched a video from the Capital Advisors Group on the May Revise, which I was going to send um, through. You guys all both saw it, yeah. But it's so different even today than it was presented on Absolutely. It's, it's, I mean, I was talking with my brother about it and just sharing the frustrations of like, I have to present a budget that I know is almost now wrong because the governor's come out and said, here's what I want to do. And the legislature said, but we want to do all these other things. Yeah. And typically, as I noted, you see sh small shifts, you see a $300 million statewide program that gets shifted from one to another. You rarely see an $8 billion change of we're going to change it from here to there. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll say it's a matter of perspective because I've been sitting in this seat when it was um, a, a horrible, horrible news. I mean, this is actually good news. Mm -hmm. Just we're not quite sure how to, you know, the piece of the pie, like how it's going to be split. So anyway, thank you for your presentation. And this public hearing is now, con well, actually, Jen Shocker, do you have anything? Any questions? No. Okay. Public hearing is now concluded. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Okay. Next up is um, item six point three, a special education local plan. And this is this a public hearing as well? Yes. So we'll open this public hearing. We get Hi, Heather. Public hearing. This is Heather Gorman. Good evening, President Deserpa, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. Um, Thank you. This is another public hearing um, to present our local budget and service plan. Oh, and I'm in charge of this. So we have three sections to go over tonight with the annual budget plan. Um, and I did want to go over some grants that we received and then the section E, the annual service plan. So a little bit about the special education local plan area or people refer to as SELPA. Special education, um, we have some requirements on how we are supposed to use our money. And these are some of the areas where we're looking at child find. That means like really looking at what students um, do need special education services. We have assurances, policies, and procedures that we have. The CDE comes in and looks at and makes sure that we have those. We have our annual service plan and our budget plan, which is tonight. And then we have our state and federal program and fiscal reports. So our annual budget plan. So each SELPA must have a responsible local agency or an administrative unit. And because we're a single SELPA district, that is Dr. Rodriguez, and <laughs> then I would be one of her designees. So that's, um, we get the funding from the state, from um, federal funds. We have local contributions that comes into our SELPA. We have the RLA and the AU unit, and then we have to provide the services to support the students. So about the special, edu special education budget, you may have heard some of this from Clint's report. When you're looking at the general education, we're all starting the same. So we have the same amount of money for both students with disabilities and students without disabilities to start. And then we have our state contribution, and then we have our federal contribution, and then the local contribution. So you may ask, why does it cost so much to fund special education? So some of this is because general increases in staff and staff salaries and pension costs account for about a third of the recent increases in special education. 
And then the remaining two-thirds are due to a rise of incidence of students with relatively severe disabilities, and specifically autism. So as you can see here, we have had um, an increase in autism from the 2000, 2000 to 2001 school year, um, where we had basically one in 600 students in 97 to 98 compared to one in 50 students in the 17-18 school year and PBUSD you can see that from the 19 to 20 school year we have 176, 206 and then 219 students and this is just students that have the primary disability of autism not a secondary or a doctor's um, diagnosis. So this is how our budget is kind of breaking out. When you look at it, we have most of our budget is going to certificated and classified um, salaries and benefits. With the benefits and the salaries, almost um, half of what that total cost is. And then we have about 8% going to services and um, supplies. And then they put it this way, so I just put it how they did. The other outgo and financing is about 2.87%. Oops. So this year, um, we did see um, some small increases, 10% um, from our federal revenue. Our state revenue is at 35%, and then our local contribution is at 55% of our total budget. And I looked back from last year compared to this year, and you see it's about the same, even though last year we were at 9% and we went up for, to 10% in our federal, and our state did about the same. Our local went down, but it was up a little bit more. So we're staying pretty much the same when you're looking at that from year to year. And the one thing I did want to note, unlike um, our, uh, our general declining enrollment, special education is not declining. We're staying pretty steady in our numbers. Okay, so I wanted to um, talk a little bit about some recent grants and grant overview that we've had in special education. So we have one-time funds with um, learning recovery funds, and this is additional support for students with special needs. Um, we had eight different areas that we needed to look at to um, say that we were supporting our sp students in those specific needs. Some of them were child find activities, catching up on testing, looking at um, how we're supporting our students with learning loss. Um, so we have those funds, they will end in 2023 and then we also have a grant that's called the alternative dispute resolution which they actually increased this year um, so that that money is really based um, given to the SELPA to really focus on parent relationships building parent relationships and helping us support if we are in dispute with um, for any reason and um, how do we support staff train and um, hopefully not get into dispute and then the last two are about our infant, our zero to three population that we serve in our district. And so we um, were, we were looked at, looking at having to have a decrease in funds. Um, right now, our general contribution to the infant the two, zero to three population is about a half a million dollars. So we didn't want the decrease to happen, so we filled out the infant waiver and we did receive that. And there's also an infant grant that we can receive. I did fill that out and apply for that grant. We can get up to $100,000 for that. I just don't know and I can maybe report back hopefully with good news at some point that we did get some or all of that grant. And then the last part of this plan is the annual service plan. And this is just basically, we have to go through every single service that we um, provide in the district, do a description of the service, and then we have to do a description of any service that we don't provide. So the plan includes a description of all the services we provide for students age zero to 22 and the services and any services that we don't um, have or we don't have the need for at this time and why we, we maybe wouldn't have the need at this time. 
And so this is just a snapshot of all of the services that we have. I'm not going to go into all of these and their descriptions because we would be here for a lot longer than you'd want to be. Um, so, you know, I, for a couple examples, we have like the 330, which is almost, you know, in every single school. Is that's the other part of it. It's looked at by every single school what services you provide. And so that's specialized academic instruction, and this means adapting and the instruction to ad address the uni unique needs of children with disabilities. But then we have some that maybe are not in every school, like 735, where we have Braille transcription for visually impaired students. Visually impaired students are students um, with low incidence disabilities, so we don't have as many students that are visually impaired, along with like deaf and hard of hearing, some of our low incidence um, students. So we have all of those, and in the actual report, it talks about um, you know where this where the um, services are and a description of all of them. And this is my report. Are there any speakers to this item? We have no speakers. Okay, are there any comments or questions from our board? Oh, sorry, yes, Jen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, if you don't have this information right now, I'm fine if it's you know communicated later, but I, I'm curious, do you happen to know how our percentage of local contribution compares to districts with other with similar characteristics. Yeah, we I actually did that last year and I didn't do it this year. Yeah. So I can go back and look from what I presented last year, it okay. was very similar and it's very similar throughout the state. Okay. Um, that, you know, we compare about the same you know, in the state of California with the local contribution being about half of you know so I bet I can go back and get some specifics. Thanks, I'd appreciate mm -hmm. that. Any questions on the side? No, okay. Um, do you write all the grants in your department for the SELPA? I have for the last couple of them. They're not, um, the, the, they're not intense grants like ones that Andrea Willie would help support. I mean, they haven't been uh, like, Lot. They they involve some some you know putting things together, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't say they've been real intense to write. Because you know as I've done a lot of grant writing, and I know there are there are monies out there that we could apply for as a district um, to I think offset some of our costs. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you, do you need more support in your department to apply for these big grants at the state and federal level? I have been applying for the ones that I've seen and known about that come through like state SELPA reaches mm -hmm. out and says, oh, there's these grants, let's go for it. So those are the ones that I've done this year, um, like the ADA and the infant grant. And so, I, okay. <laughs> thank if you. If there's help, we can always take it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I just wanna make sure we get every dollar we're eligible yes, for. Okay. Exactly. Thanks very much, great report. The conclusion of the public hearing, thank you. One more public hearing. This is item 6.4, public hearing of board appointed personnel commissioner. Opening the public hearing. Hi, Pam. Good evening, President DeSerpa, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, yes, the item before you tonight is the public hearing um, for the board appointed personnel commissioner. It does give the public the opportunity to express their views on the qualifications of the person that the board has announced as their appointee uh, to serve on the unexpired term of the personnel commission. Uh, Mr. Ocasio O'Brien was announced at your April board meeting. Um, as your recommendation, and later in the agenda, I will ask that the board approve him, uh, appoint him to the um, position of personnel commissioner. Are there any speakers to this item? None. And any comments from the board? No, okay, great, Thank thanks Pam. Public hearing now closed. Next up on our agenda is item 7.1, our um, visitor non-agenda items. This is two minutes each. Um, and this is a public comment time to talk about anything that is not on the agenda. Okay, so under this item we have four speakers. So we have Bill Beecher followed by Lucia Herrera, Veronica Galigar, and Chris Webb. Good evening, Madam President, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, trustees and staff. Uh, 
I really enjoy the early part of uh, these meetings where you discuss what you've been involved in and engaged in because it gives us, the community, a sense of how engaged you are in this district. Unfortunately, only four of the seven really report on anything substantive about education. Several of the three who aren't engaged talk about being, you know, going to social functions, flipping hamburgers. Uh, that bothers me. I'm a taxpayer. We're all taxpayers. Almost everybody in this room is here because we want to see better education for our students. So my question is, is what the heck are the other three doing here? Is it for medical benefits? They sure as heck aren't here to promote better education because I don't see any engagement. And we have two that aren't even here. Now I proposed several months ago that you amend your bylaws to actually take steps against those who aren't actively engaged. I would suggest that you look at that again. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, is Lucia Herrera here? Oh, she's coming. Here she comes. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Lucia Herrera, Baba teacher at Amesi Elementary. I'm requesting that visual art teachers, Baba teachers, have no more than 10 classes. When we have 11 or more classes, we have to prep for 264 potential students. I may have this year, uh, this coming year, about 250 potential students, and that is a lot. We do not have enough time to prep, especially with no subs available like this year. Those who know me, they will know that I'm not afraid of working hard. But yes, I'm afraid of not being able to give our students what they deserve due to our workload due to our workload. I had this problem before, and I know that this is not doable. By doing this, we are set to fail, not for success. I was able to deal with this in the past, thanks to Dr. Rodriguez, who opened her door and gave a solution to our problem. I am very, very, very lucky to have a great administrators in our site. And that is also thanks to Dr. Rodriguez, who also opened the door for that problem. But this problem has to be solved at the district level, not at any site. You have to change our contract if you want to keep teachers in our district, especially Papa teachers. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, Veronica Gallagher, followed by Chris Webb. Hi, I'm Veronica Gallagher. I work at H.A. Hyde Elementary School. I've been there about 26 years um, teaching second grade. And, um, you know, it's been the honor of my life to work with the students we have. They're, they're amazing, they're brilliant, and the families are so hardworking and dedicated. And it was their positive attitudes that helped me through these last two years. These last two years have been very, very challenging. Um, Anxiety has been extremely high for all of us. So many students and staff members, including myself, got COVID. Um, there were so many student and staff absences. In addition, we had very few substitutes. Teachers who were able to come were called on regularly to cover other classrooms, taking on extra students, even in the special ed classes, which is very dangerous. And um, also losing prep time. And my daughter works at, at Watsonville High School as a math teacher. She missed prep time so often, she was having mental anxiety over it, and she really wants to quit. Both my daughters work for this district now, and they are talking about quitting, and they're just getting started on their careers. One's a special ed teacher, all of the issues and, and my daughter's a math teacher. You need math teacher. She's experienced, 10 years experience, but called on so many times to take, 
no subs. So when uh, no subs, no prep time. So then they're working. I mean, teachers already work overtime. New teachers, especially, overtime. If you don't get prep time, you're working way into the night. It's just you can't sustain a, a profession like this. Um, teachers are leaving. Teachers I know left early because of all the issues. Um, we have so many vacancies in our district. So what have you come up with to, to help this situation? I'm hearing that the reading intervention teachers might have to go to different sites to cover all the vacancies. Uh, you know, these reading intervention teachers were hired to help the youngest students who struggled the most during distance learning. And, you know, oh, I better put my glasses on here. Um, these students now desperately need reading support to accelerate their learning. All of the SIPs data and the DIBBLES data Thank we you. have collected show how low they are, even still. They need more support. We cannot lose these reading teachers. You need to get substitutes. Pay Thank them you. more money. Pay them more money. Thank you have you. to. Thank you for your time. You go on the website and you see how low it's paid. People aren't going to take it. Pay the starting teachers higher salaries. Gilroy pays 60000 a year. I uh, that we'll be respectful of the time. Uh, so thank you so much. We have to do something. We can't continue another year like this. Thank you. And we're, you're not going to have teachers. Do you see that was one of the things they said here? Thank we you. We want teachers in our classrooms. My dear, that we have to end your glaring. comment now. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Chris Webb. Uh, I want to thank PVFT and Nelly for helping support Renaissance with the recent field trip. And I also want to thank Clint Rucker, whom she reached out to for additional support. When Clint and Rich Arellanos came through with the level of support I didn't even know was possible, I never felt that PVUSD cared more than I did in that moment. So on behalf of my students and I, I thank you. Uh, I also want to thank Dr. Rodriguez for the, the little things of the screen cleaner and the cookie. The cleaner is actually useful for me, and uh, I love some baked goods with my morning coffee, so thank you for coming on time. Um, also, I want to thank Trustee DeSerpa for doing her duty and living up to the month mantra of whole community by allowing my student to be heard at the last board meeting. Um, I think that was the right decision for, for multiple reasons and especially considering we've had board trustees zoom in this year and also there's the fact that um, she was basically calling for teachers to be allowed to do what Shocker is doing right now. Um, and just to her point, like that was the single biggest positive intervention I think I saw at Renaissance this whole year. And it was like an accident. I never saw more change in students so quickly. You could hold higher expectations and they were going with it because they understood you as a human and they, were, they wanted to do right by the next generation. So I, I really um, think that we ought to consider what that student said. We have some really great, I loved hearing the students last year, or last meeting. And not just that student, but all of them. And Rafael, or Herman Rafael Guzman, love hearing him. I hope I hear him again here, or as an elected official of some kind. But um, our students have really good ideas, and I feel like we should uh, move forward with them. And if we do, we can become an even better district. And I'm already looking at taking my kids here because of how responsive we've been already. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any more public speakers? No. Okay, next up we have item 8.1, um, employee. I, 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 had my, I had six and seven on the card. Laura Azaro. We'll check it out. So you only submitted one speaker card, but you had both numbers on it? That's correct, yes. It says it's it's in the 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 numbers on one card. Okay. Come on down, Laura. <laughs> and go. Hi, thank you. 
Jennifer, I want to thank you personally right now for keeping your arm into the legislature of our government. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm trying to stay very involved in that too through our union. Um, so getting back to the reading intervention teachers, um, yes, I am one, and I love my site. I've been there for 24 years, but I'm not here to tell you how much I don't want to leave my site to go help in another school for vacancies. That's not why I'm standing here. I would do it if, if I was really needed to do it, even though I completely disagree with it, and I think it's just basically the dog chasing its tail, because I have filled in uh, when subs haven't shown up regularly this past year, so that would be gone. But I do have another idea. I've been talking to staff members over the last week when I got this news about, you know, is there anything that we could do differently to help solve this problem? And one of them that kept coming up, these, this is a friend of mine who doesn't work for our district but tried to work for our district, um, is kind of tighten up the Human Resources Department, and I'm not finger pointing at any person at the Human Resources Department. I've walked in there numerous times, I've talked to them on the phone. The people that work in there are wonderful. They're friendly, they're professional, they help when they can, but the systems and the protocols really do need to be looked at in our Human Resources Department. Um, you know, over the last, it, it kind of goes around, it's just the bottom line is, when he, people get into EdJoin and want to become a teacher at our district, their, the gateway is human resources. And many times, the biggest problem is getting that interview. Uh, it's the response at that first step. There's just too much of a lag. So uh, to wrap up, just I think we need somebody to take human resources and just help them tighten up their protocols. There's other districts that do it better, and maybe it's our year's time to Thank you. look at that. Thank you. Then we pick up our teachers. Okay, thank you. Um, now we'll move on to employee organization comments. These are five minutes apiece, and we'll start with 8.1 PVFT, or the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Good evening, board. Dr. Rodriguez. Um, so I thought my message tonight would be more relaxed, but nope. The sunshine that we've been having has not been able to break through the shadow this administration casts over as educators. I do want to say that it's nice to see our teachers that show up and make sure to say something very positive, because I know that they all experience something positive. But I see things from a different perspective as I represent all of our members. So last time I stood here, I spoke about the reassignments the SELPA and the ECE were conducting. While they have the contractual right, the underlying reasons lack integrity. These rash decisions, which are then delivered by personnel who lack any respect for their staff or lack some respect for their staff person, only do harm to our professional and learning community. Recently, HR informed us, as you heard, that they could temporarily place intervention teachers. This is what we did with our TOSAs this last year. Um, the intervention teachers work directly with students on a daily basis. So very big difference is that they do work with our students daily, um, with our students. Their contracts range from 40% to 100%, so we have many, we have some that are 100% FTE and then some that are only part-time. And they work in small and large groups teaching math and reading and are an integral part of facilitating students' progress and supporting the classroom teachers program. The support helps classroom teachers as it can allow for a double dose of SIPs while helping the student achieve a year or two of quantifiable growth in reading skills. So that's a several teachers who have communicated with me um, have said that this is the data that they've seen um, that has been very promising for them this year, um, but that's because they were there. Um, they, were able, they were there to help their students. Pulling intervention support would hurt our most, most vulnerable students and jeopardize their growth. And we, the PBFT, do understand that this is, that we're, we're in a precarious position, um, having to decide to either have a vacant classroom, which we're always advocating against, um, or no student intervention. So it is, um, yeah, what is, we don't, it, it's just such an ugly position to be in. But these moves definitely cause some to reach their breaking point and quit. So 
You heard one teacher express how her own daughters are considering quitting. Um, this year, just for the total for this year running record, there's about 121 educators have either resigned or retired during the course of this school year. And then so we still have very many vacancies to fill this summer and we still have resignations coming in. Uh, so, you know, we're gonna still continue to see more as departments to continue to feed there. And, and I, so you could take it as the way that I'm gonna say it, but I see it as it's, here's this power position that I'm in and I'm going to make this change and you need to accept this decision because it's what they deem best. Um, and so I hear it from our members who call in and it, as an individual or communicate with me as a group and say, this is not how we see it. Um, and then I don't know how much time I have. Maria, can you give me my time? A minute and 30 seconds. Okay. So on occasion, often actually, I do bring up that some of the decisions that are made are um, made sometimes because those members happen to be treated differently. So I will definitely point out the ECE department on that one. Um, and so these are teachers or members who are experiencing these microaggressions in which I also, as the president of the PVFT, experience these microaggressions from our administration when I speak to them. So being told you're just, you know, you can't always rely on the race card because why? Because I'm brown? being told that despite the person not being a person of color, being told that they are just as Mexican as the people that come here to our country from Mexico. So again, a microaggression that still the power play of, I hold something more over you. So, this, so I bring this up because I have, over the course of this year, actually the past couple of years, have suggested that management be trained on anti-bias and anti-racist, um, have received that kind of training. I think it's important. Uh, I think it's important that our management communicate to our employees with respect and value the positions, the skills that they bring to our our district because we don't want to see them quit. This is a teacher's market right now. It's an educator's market. So thank, thank you. you. Okay, item 8.2, CSEA. Is there any point of order? Hmm. Uh, we do have a speaker. Oh, Bill Beecher. so sorry. Bill Beecher. I was going to have Clint do the numbers because people get emotional when I get up here. Uh, it's obvious from all the data we've got more teachers retiring than we can hire. And it's not just true for our district, it's also true for the United States as a whole. And I've talked about this in the past. Well, you can't keep trying to teach the way we're teaching today when you're not going to have enough teachers. On average, we're going to lose 50 teachers a year going out over time. That means we're going to have lots of problems with not enough teachers in classrooms. I mentor several students, and one of them came to me yesterday and talked to me about the Math 3 pre-calculus. The teacher wasn't very good. They went to the principal. They didn't get any results. Eventually, the teacher quit. The math department head came in and couldn't teach the class. The students weren't allowed to get out of the class, and so they blew one whole year in a class that, uh, it's a shame. But this problem is gonna get worse and worse. This, this student won't be the only student that has those kinds of issues. We've got to, we the board, PBFT, everybody has to start looking at how the heck do we teach in the future when we're going to have fewer teachers for the students that we've got. You can't use the old paradigm. All of this, my poor teachers, they hurt. Yeah, well, yeah, everybody's hurting. I mean, the administration's hurting just trying to be able to put teachers in a place. I mean, everybody's hurting from this. 
But this is insanity. You can't keep doing what you're doing and expect different results. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more public speakers? Not to this item. Okay, next up we have CSEA, California School Employees Association. Doesn't look like anyone's here tonight, maybe from CSEA, last call. Um, okay, we'll move on to PAVAM, the Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. Is anyone presenting tonight? It doesn't appear so. Okay. And last, we have the Communication Workers of America, CWA, representing our substitutes. Okay, moving on to item nine, report and discussion items. Um, we'll start with 9.1, Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen Project Status Update. Good evening. Thank you, President DeSerpa and trustees for having us tonight. Um, I'm Linda Bixby. My colleague Nancy Sherrod and I are really excited to be here um, to not to tell you what you already know about the wonderfulness of Emerald's Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen, which is under construction now at Starlight Elementary, but to give you a bit of an update really quickly on our, on our campaign. Um, which as of today we have raised $890,000 from community donations. And we'll talk a little bit about how unusual that is to be going out to the community and asking for donations. Um, but who are the community, who is this community that, that are providing these donations? That's kind of what we want to share with you about a little bit. Um, as I think you know, we've led many tours of the site, um, taking people to Starlight, let them look at the project site and learn from Dr. Rodriguez and many of you who have attended, thank you, those of you who have come and been very um, eloquent advocates for the project during some of these tours. So over 250 people over the last 12 months have come in small groups to the site to learn about the project and to, and to learn about the the district much more deeply, um, just from Dr. Rodriguez, from Starlight Principal Jackie Medina, um, from Julie Edwards talking about career technical education, and Michael Russo talking about the integration with science curriculum. So it's been a very rich, almost discussion groups that happen during these tours, where most of these folks who come to the tours have little or no connection with the district prior to their visit. So sort of reaching out into the community in a very different way. And the people who come to the tours are elected leaders and community members, businesses, business owners and um, educators, a lot of retired educators, donors, and so forth. And so this is a, a first it, um, introduction to them to really what PVUSD is all about. So um, that's a quick snapshot. We've had 26 of these tours. As I said, 200 and fi over 250 people have come. And many of, of the donations that have come have, have originated from these, these small tours in the garden. So of our million dollar campaign goal, having raised almost 90% of that. We're very excited about that, but we're really here to talk about the other result that we're really excited about, which is the community engagement that is happening um, and the education that's happening about how education is being done in, in the school district. Nancy? So, um, you know, as we all know, as engaged um, board members that you are, you know that this was the first time that the school district uh, made the effort to do a community fund development campaign. And as Linda said, we're going to talk some about what we've learned in this process. But the first thing that we did is we did um, about 30 Zoom meetings with community leaders, just asking for their advice and listening to them to find out what their questions were about the project um, so that we could kind of tailor how we were presenting the project then as another step. So in those listenings that we had, some of the questions were, 
well, why has this school been chosen? And how are other students in the district going to benefit from this? Um, and if I could also just say a huge uh, congratulations to you for um, now um, having the gardens by 2024 in every one of your elementary schools. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. And your district is shining, I think, with some of the wonderful work that is happening. And just again on another note, as Linda said, we've had all these tours, and Linda and I have attended all of these tours, and honest to goodness, I get inspired every time I go to a tour, and I learn something every time I go to a tour. So we have had now these 240 visitors, but when you think about it, it's a multiplier of times 10 because those are the people that are gonna go out and talk about your district and because they've learned about your district. So that's been a wonderful thing. Those advice visits that we had at first, again, that same sort of thing, in-depth one-on-one conversations. And we, we just found out that um, we could really kind of scope the campaign in a way that helped to elevate the district in some really significant new ways. So, this, our little campaign team, lots of familiar names. Um, it really has taken a, a top-notch team and we've, we've been really privileged to work with um, the PVUSD folks, certainly Dr. Rodriguez and Jackie and Andrea Carlos Willie, who, without whom the f initial $500,000 grant would would not have been uh, granted to the district. Um, so Life Lab educators and um, and we we realized early on that because we didn't feel a lot of people understood a lot about the district outside of the education community we needed some community connectors so we recruited some people that who know lots of people and they know lots of other people and we recruited them as volunteers to work with us and um rob allen and um Amy Harrington, Leo Lilipidis, Janet Mayu, who you may remember from working on the PVPSA uh, project, really hardworking folks, started helping us bring people to the tours. And, and, and then we, we realized that in order to kind of launch the campaign, we needed a big funder. We needed someone with a high profile in the community that could be our anchor funder and really sort of validate um, the, the idea of, of the community coming behind us and, and making, you know, donations out of their own pockets. So we made a proposal to the Health Trust Board. I'm sure they might wish to claw some of that money back now, but they made us the largest um, grant in the history of the, the Health Trust and became our anchor funder. And many of their board members and certainly their executive director DeAndre came to tours and spoke also very eloquently um, about the value of the project and the integration that the project would have with their own mission in the community and so uh, that was a big boost for us and the Pajaronian covered it and that was really um, that really kind of got the campaign up and running. So um, some of the things that we have learned already about um, these from our tours and our conversations is that um, tour attendees tell us how impressed they are that a program like this was being established at the earliest grade levels and would create such a rich foundation for students as they advance through middle and high school. Community members also really resonated with the life skills and social emotional learning and whole child, whole family that the district's embracing. Um, as we mentioned, we had some incredible staff that came to many of our tours. Mike Russo, he was so wonderful at articulating the value of experiential learning in the sciences. And Julie Edwards was such a passionate and effective speaker in explaining all the connections happening with with CTE, career tech education. That was something that really resonated with people. We also um, 
have some advisors such as Susan True and Hillary Bryant at the Community Foundation. They've attended tours and the foundation granted the project $50,000. And then through their donor advised fund folks, we've added another 135,000 to the campaign. Um, from community foundation donor advisors. And those are people from all over the community. So it isn't just folks in the Pajaro Valley. So it's, it's a wonderful um, statement of commitment to your district. So you'll recognize a lot of the names on this list. Um, we started connecting with some of the really long time businesses and families of agriculture um, and really felt, you know, that can be kind of a tough nut to crack, the agricultural community, in terms of um, just just getting, getting connections there. It can be sort of insular. And so we were able to get a number of tour visitors coming from ag families and they really loved, they loved what they were hearing, they loved what they were learning. George Crocker, who grew up uh, just right around the corner from Starlight Elementary School when Starlight was a drive-in movie, told a great little story about when he was a little kid and used to jump over the fence and sneak into the drive-in. And then at another tour, one of the ag uh, woman from an ag family, a retired educator, told us about how she used to ride her horse through that property before it was ever a Starlight movie theater and ride through the fields that became what is now Starlight Elementary School. And there, there was just genuine joy on the part of these families to, to know that such a large chunk of property was going to be restored to growing food and nourishing the, the minds and the bodies and the spirits of, of your students. Um, and they began making generous gifts. So it's, it's interesting to think about how the tours, of course, we would take people out to a big, a huge big dirt lot. And, and still your staff and the people that were there were able to inspire so many donors. And of course the wonderful little current garden um, that, that Dr. Rodriguez would always tell our guests, wait until you go into the little garden and listen to your, listen to your heartbeat and you'll probably see some change. And, and so we, all, we helped everybody connect to the wonderful things that can happen um, in this kind of a learning space. So um, I'm sure you've all seen <laughs> this photo, and you may know this, but the roof is is being um, right now put upon the kitchen. <laughs> so yeah. we're we're so excited. I I stopped by the other day just to see how things were looking, um, and we're going to talk a little bit later about about the development of the actual garden also, but. Um, so one of the things, of course, that you do in a capital campaign is that you have naming opportunities for different aspects of, of whatever it is that you are, are um, building. So I think in your packet, we've, we've also included, not here on the slideshow, but in your packet, a list of the naming opportunities. And um, they range from $10,000 to $100,000 in the kitchen. And um, eight of those have been taken uh, out of the 10. And um, you also may have heard that the city of Watsonville gave a, a gift of $100,000. And that's going to put the city's name on the outdoor garden classroom, which is really exciting. Um, and actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke a little bit. Um, of the 25 naming opportunities in the garden, there are only five that are left. So we, we're certainly still working on all of that, but it, it's pretty gratifying to see um, how some of these wonderful um, businesses and, and donors have stepped up and are going to also be honored within, within this project. We've also been working on, on getting in-kind donors and have um, granite rock donating materials, and we have also hopefully um, a landscape company that's going to be involved. We also have a couple of employee groups that want to come out and help to plant the garden. So lots, lots is still going to be happening. Mm -hmm. So this is just a really quick little timeline as we near the end of our presentation. These are just kind of seminal moments along the campaign journey. Um, 
I'll echo what Nancy said about the decision to expand school gardens to all 16 of the elementary schools. That was extremely motivating and pa a powerful statement of commitment uh, to experiential education, which as everyone knows is so critical and so effective. Um, so that was a super important benchmark for the campaign. So I just want to say a word about and beyond. Um, because one of the things that, that has come from this, one of these, the other results that, that we wanted to share, people, people want to be connected <clears throat> to the district. People want to be part of the project. People want to learn more about what's happening here. Excitement has really been generated from, from just what they've learned from, from Dr. Rodriguez and the staff during these visits. Those of you who've attended have seen it yourselves. Um, donors are, we've got, had almost 100 individual donors have made gifts now to this campaign. Um, and they all have different reasons for wanting to support it. There's so many facets of this project that, um, that there's a lot to love. And some donors just simply want to support the children and the families of agriculture. Others come from, as we said, very, they have a, their own very deep roots in, in agriculture. Um, others, for them, it's about equity and, and access to high quality programs. They're so thrilled to hear about the, the depth and the aspirations and the intentionality of, of the goals of the way education is being done in, in PVUSD now. It's truly generating uh, enthusiasm. And as we've mentioned a couple of times, but it can't be overstated, the career technical education aspect really makes sense to people. People are excited for the employers who are going to be benefiting. They're excited for the students who are s soon to be citizens who will be earning uh, living wage, living wages, supporting their families and contributing to the community. That's a nugget that really makes a lot of sense. So the and beyond is that people are coming forward wanting to partner with the district, new nonprofit partnerships, uh, volunteering time and ideas and resources. And I know that with the uh, budding industry partner relationships that are, that are being built, um, more beneficial connections and resources are going to continue to flow to the district. So as we already mentioned, we are at about 90% of our community fund development goal of $1 million. And we are very confident of reaching that $1 million goal. But we are also um, wanting to continue to work really hard within the community to raise as much as we possibly can. So we're certainly not stopping uh, at that. And we have several um, potential wonderful donors um, that are we're hopeful will uh, join the campaign. Um, and this is kind of a common thing that does happen with capital campaigns. That last part um, takes a little while, and we're going to talk also about the um, community campaign. Yes, so, so far we've done what we call a, a, a quiet campaign, which is we go out to, you know, individual major donors and, and businesses and kind of do it, you know, on the down low a little bit. And um, once, once we reach a certain level of the campaign and we're pretty close to it, then we go out into the community and solicit donations of all sizes so that everyone in the community can contribute at a level that's comfortable for them and can have be a part of the project. So we are waiting for a couple of large pending donations to come in. We hope they're going to ma materialize. That's going to put us to the point where we can go out to our community and, and raise the rest. It will be splashy and wonderful way to kick off the, the community campaign. And we hope that can happen in the next uh, month or so. We've already made arrangements to start tabling at farmers markets and just kind of dovetailing on other organizations' activities to start getting our word out and getting a lot of media. Because as I said, we've been kind of on the down low. This is an area when the community campaign launches where the board can be extremely helpful in, in just continuing to talk about it. And I'm sure you're going to be interviewed because we're going to start really beating the bushes for some major um, media coverage. and. Be, be aware. <laughs> so 
the donor wall, I'll just share really quickly, you may know um, artist Kathleen Crochetti, who is a, just a fabulous mosaic and glass artist, and she is going to design the donor appreciation wall, which is nine feet by five feet, and it's gonna go right there on the front of the kitchen building. And it's going to utilize uh, Spanish tiles, which is a, a motif that's going to be carried out throughout throughout the project in all of the signage and the naming opportunity signs. So it's going to be really beautiful. Kathleen actually went to Fire Clay in Aromas and got most of the tiles donated. These are hand-painted Spanish tiles. It's going to be very, very special. Um, yeah, so. Donor voices. That's our that's our um, our campaign presentation for you. Again, these sort of uh, reflect some of a, a lot of what we hear. These these kind of exemplify what we're hearing. Is that you know people are people are inspired by the project. They're excited by the project, and we're going to continue to work hard to raise the rest of the money and as much beyond. I mean, it happens in capital campaigns sometimes that you exceed your goal and we certainly hope that that's gonna be the case with this one. Thank you so much for having us and we're here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, are there any speakers? The no speakers to this item. Okay, any comments or questions from the board? Jennifer Holm. I just want to say that I love this project, um, mm -hmm. particularly how it connects, you know, school to community. That was something that was really important that had me decide to be in this seat. You know, um, it, it makes a difference when our community sees how the schools serve the entire community. So, yay! Definitely agree. That's it. Thank you. Trusty shocker. Isn't <laughs> <laughs> just looking at me? <laughs> well, they already know that I love this project, and I, I've tried to go to as many um, tours as I possibly mm -hmm. can at, at the garden and tell everybody I can about the garden. Mm -hmm. So I just appreciate all the hard work. Um, thank you, Dr. Rodriguez and board for standing behind this project. And there's a lot of excitement, not only at the community level, but from families, mm -hmm. um, especially Starlight families that are very excited um, to see the progress on the kitchen. They've watched it from nothing to, like you said, the roof almost going on. I got a chance to see it. Um, last week, so it's um, amazing to see, and it's something that um, is only going to be joy, mm -hmm. and it's going to further um, different aspects of education for our students, mm -hmm. so thank you. Thank you for your presence and enthusiasm, too, and, and there are a number of people up here and on the staff who have made monetary contributions as well, personal donations, which we're extremely grateful for also. That's a very strong statement too. Thank, thank you. Thank you and thanks for all your hard work of soliciting course. all those donations and of making course. those special Our connections. Pleasure. Stay with it. Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank, you. thank you. We'll see you at the ribbon cutting. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. Okay, next up is uh, item 9.2, a wellness policy triannual, tri, tri, triannual assessment. <laughs> this is our director, Linda Liu. Yes. Uh, good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez and Cabinet. Uh, my name is Linda Liu, and I'm here to present an update on the PVUSD Wellness Committee and the triennial assessment <laughs> process and results. So I've brought a team of presenters today who partner with my department in various wellness projects and whose organizations uh, or departments have been longtime participants in the Wellness Committee. Um, it's great to have that team and also this you know, wonderful presentation before about the Emerald Lagasse Kitchen. It's, it's all of those projects that help improve on what students want to choose when they come through the, the lunch line, the breakfast line. So um, we're always trying to partner with and, and uh, really encourage that we support programs like that. 
also a little bit about the um, the wellness policy. And because we have um, our limited presentation time today, we're going to move quickly through the information. But uh, please, any more details can be provided as, as people request. So school wellness policies were first required by USDA, so the federal government, in 2006. Um, there was the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act of 2010 that um, had some updated uh, stricter rules, and so um, revisions were required, and our latest version was approved in 2018. A, an assessment of your policy is required every three years, and we had the disruption um, with distance learning, and so there was a waiver that was given to um, due to COVID delays, but this year, as we return to instruction in person, um, our wellness committee made the assessment the main goal of the year in our meetings, and so we worked very hard on the assessment process, and I want to uh, say thank you to um, Kat Satterley of Alliance for a Healthier Generation and Crystal Caballero from Santa Cruz County Public Health who worked uh, hand in hand with us on that. Um, I just want to talk a little bit of some of the goals that are set forth in the policy. So the first section of the PVUSD wellness policy um, is about school meals. And so I wanted to give an update on some of our, um, how our department programs support the goals that are set forth in the policy. So supporting access to school meals. So. Um, this is one of the goals in the policy and you know one of the main goals of our department so um, we can run several meal programs and we try to access every single um, program that we can qualify for um, every school uh, we're able to serve breakfast and lunch um, every day of the school calendar even when they leave on field trips um, and also on Saturdays for Saturday Academy and then also during the summer. We try to run as many uh, summer locations as possible and we can feed anyone age one to 18 in an open site during the summer. Um, also with eligibility, so um, one is just having the, the offering of the meals, but also eligibility for free meals. So prior to 2020, uh, we applied for as many provisions as possible so that this would allow students to automatically qualify for free meals, um, not have to do the paperwork or have any stigma tied to it or any kind of paperwork um, red tape. Um, so we would apply for the provisions, um, but this kind of all changed with COVID, so um, everyone realized how how important school meals were to everyone during the emergency. And since March 2020, um, federal government waived um, eligibility for all children. So everyone was able to eat for free in the past few years. This is now ending as of this month. Um, but fortunately, state of California moving forward, um, there's money in the budget right now. <laughs> money in the budget right now um, and they are um, creating a universal meal program starting the new school year so meals breakf one breakfast one lunch will still be free um, for our students in the new school year a little bit of um, stats from our meals so prior to COVID this was kind of our average um, year um, a little over a million breakfasts um, a little under two million lunches and about half a million after school meals during distance learning, there were a lot of waivers to allow for take home, uh, allow to feed on non-school days, to allow to feed weekends, holidays, spring break, winter break. So we try to take you know, advantage and make sure that we offered all of that to as many families that wanted to come and pick up. And so um, we, we saw some increases in breakfast and after school meals because we were able to give all three meals at one time. So that's why you see kind of increased numbers there. And now, um, in the current year, um, obviously, a little bit of de you know declining enrollment, um, absences with ongoing COVID issues. We do see a, um, a bit of a drop this year um, in the in the meals served. So some photos about let's see our our school meals so prior to COVID we were working really hard on expanding kind of fresh options salad bars implementing that so here's a PV high where we did a California Thursdays um, meal for all the students um, and because of provision all the students ate for free so just trying to let them know they can eat for free and this is what we have in the cafeteria um, adding salad bars to um, the different schools, and then this is Calabasas um, salad bar um, that we were able to add. So that's what we were doing prior to COVID. Um, you know, everything changed in 2020, and we switched to parent pickup. So this some examples of what that looked like. Um, um, you know, everything had to become packaged, um, but there was a lot of, you can see uh, spirit with our cafeteria staff and trying to make pickup fun and keep that connection going for students, um, for the students and the parents when they came by because uh, with 
school closed, um, that daily interaction with their cafeteria staff wasn't there, so um, they try to make it as fun as possible for the for the families. And then here's a pickup at um, Buena Vista Migrant Camp um, in the evening, so trying to have um, a pickup time that worked for um, families that worked in the daytime but could come a little bit later in the day. I, I know throughout my presentation there's like, oh, and the COVID interrupted, um, but on a, on a positive note, um, some wonderful partnerships came out of that time. So um, this is uh, Elkhorn Slough Foundation raised money and uh, was able to purchase produce from local organic farmers and they would donate it to us and our staff would package it and pass it out. This is um, Hall District on the left. And then partnership with um, Second Harvest Food Bank. Um, we did partnerships both with uh, food bags for the families to pass them out at the same time as our food, but also with their CalFresh outreach. So they were able to set up resources for families and they can come and get qualified when they came to get food. Um, so now we're back in school and it was a very important year for us. We wanted to reconnect with the students. Um, we wanted to get them excited and announce the fact that meals are still all free for everyone and you know come to the cafeteria and, and join us. And so here are some new menu items that we started this year. Um, and it was quite a challenging year because we were so excited to reach hopefully more students now that everyone was free. Um, and then just the, the supply chain issues made it so that the things that we put on the menu did not always arrive. Um, all the ingredients did not always arrive. Um, different packaging did not always arrive. So it got a little tricky, um, but we're hoping for a better year next year. Um, there was, uh, there's a few times where we were allowed to still do parent pickups, so during winter break we were able to do this um, the first day of winter break, so I thank our staff because we offered out extra work and we had enough people that um, agreed to do it, so we were able to pass out the first day of winter break um, for families, and then we did the same thing this past Monday. So after all of our cafeteria staff had their last day last Friday, we had a group that agreed to work extra this past Monday, and then we passed out meals from the parking lot here to families to to cover them for this week. Um, so here's a slide kind of like about how we make menus. Um, I can, I wanna make sure I'm, I, I didn't even remember to start my timer, so I'm not exactly sure where I am. So I'm just gonna go quickly through this. Um, mainly we, you know, our goal with the menu is to make sure that students have choices, um, that they have healthy options. Um, but in the end, it's a tricky situation because Unlike the classroom, if adults feel this is the curriculum they should have and this is the level of challenge you should have, they are in, in the classroom and then that's what they will be doing. The tricky part of us saying this is what I want the students will eat, they can decide to eat it or not. And I think that's, that's why I'm saying that partnering with these different um, educators about nutrition and wellness and them learning about school gardens, the more that they get, the students get educated about healthy eating, it makes it better for us because once we put those items on the menu, they'll actually come and choose it because um, it, that's the trickier part about us is they can choose and say, I don't want that salad, so I'll just eat something else. <laughs> Um, of course, being um, a producer of food and using packaging, um, we're always trying to uh, care about waste reduction. Um, this is um, two of our um, food and nutrition services staff who received the um, uh, the award at the board meeting earlier uh, la last month, I believe, um, for their work with the city of Watsonville. Um, here's an example of a share station. So uh, with the federal uh, guidelines on what they need to take to be a complete reimbursable meal. If a student has to take the minimum that we require, if there's something that they don't choose to eat, they can share it with their, their other students and that's what we have the share stations for. And again, uh, prior we were uh, making share tables at all schools and labeling them and making them nice and compliant with the health department rules and we were starting to use bulk dispensers for, for uh, service wear. We work with Aptos High um, Environmental Science AP class and we uh, started a pilot for bulk condiment dispensers, uh, working with City of Watsonville on pilots for food separation, a lot of different things and then COVID and everything had to be wrapped and it was very painful to see that happening. Um, but we're trying hard this year to get that reversed and, um, and, and hopefully next year. Again, we'll be hoping for a better year. In the wellness policy, there's also language about um, purchasing local. So um, Watsonville Coast Produce is our main produce distributor and they provided the data for this. So local produce, um, 
definition as within 250 miles, and uh, they provided the, the statistics, and we were able to meet the goal set forth in the policy of um, over 40% uh, purchasing. And Patrick Littleton will also speak to our um, FFVP recess grant purchasing, which is from a different distributor, and he'll speak about those st statistics. Um, farm to school is highlighted in the policy as well. Um, we love to highlight local produce. We are surrounded by farms. There are large farms, so we, but we also try to find those small farms that um, maybe have like that small app, that smaller apple that um, doesn't sell um, to the commercial market, but is like the perfect apple that can be on the school breakfast, school lunch. So um, this is some examples of that. We've done a lot of this work over the years, but I'm trying to keep it going. So just a quick photo of um, trying to bring a, a farmer highlighting things during uh, Farm to School Month in October, um, Harvest of the Month, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So Harvest of the Month, uh, we try to put something on the menu every month that's in season, and if we can, it comes from a local um, farm, organic if we can, and then trying to educate on the name of the farm and, and where it's coming from and trying to partner with these different agencies to all repeat that same messaging of, great, this is in season, you're going to see it here, you're going to cook with it here, you're going to hear some math lesson about it here, and, and maybe uh, like we did here with the, um, the cooking lesson for families, maybe your parents see something about it too. So now everyone in the family has here, heard about it, and it's on the school lunch menu for that month. So um, May, we did organic strawberries. This is um, Javier from JSN, and uh, we have the Starlight kids that, that did a cooking video. If you want to check it out, it's on the PVUSD streaming channel. Um, lastly, oops, oops, I'm not sure where I'm pointing this. Okay, so this is not in the policy, but I'll, I just want to do a, a quick thank you to my um, my uh, my office staff, my supervisors, because um, over the years I've been able to gain this team um, that wanted to um, work together and go out and do fun promotions with our students. And so we have like our warehouse, our buyer, our supervisors, and you know I, I guess we're leaving the office unattended, but we go and we try to get out there and do things with the students. Um, and so uh, this is just a quick example. I have years of photos, but um, for, to keep it short on time, um, this. We went to PD High and many some other schools this year, um, juicing this produce and then uh, putting the juice on the menu. And then this is at Radcliffe um, and. Uh, trying out these blenderless uh, smoothies, but because we want to do a fun activity with the kids, we brought the smoothie bike. So, um, and I'm not going to go over food sales because after we reopened after COVID, we have not been selling snacks, which we are allowed to sell compliant snacks, um, but we haven't been selling them since March 2020, and right now I don't have um, a goal to start that at this moment. So, um, I think most of what I'm doing now is just answering any questions for principals or anyone that's doing food sales if they want to better understand the USDA guidelines on what they're allowed to sell. So there's USDA, state, and then our wellness policy guidelines on what we can sell. So I hope that was in time. Uh, next I'd like to introduce uh, Patrick Littleton. Good evening. Thank you, uh, President De Serpa. Uh, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, PVSD trustees. I appreciate this opportunity. I would like to talk about two programs this evening that support our PVSD wellness policy. The first is our fresh fruit and vegetable program at 12 grant funded elementary schools. We serve four days a week during the morning recess. It consists of primary local California grown fruits and vegetables. 30% of it is organic and 60% is locally grown within that 250 miles. Over 200,000 fruits, uh, 200,000 pounds of fruits and vegetables were served this school year. Thanks to our one to two staff per school site. Fitness for Life through extended learning has also helped cover some of the staff vacancies this year to keep the program up and running. Nutrition education happens through eating a rainbow and a lot of other fun promotions we do throughout the school year. This is what a typical cart looks like as it is getting ready to roll out for that morning recess. This is here at Radcliffe Elementary, thanks to Erika, who does an amazing job being able to fully illustrate the benefits of eating specific fruits and vegetables. 
here at uh, Hall District. Uh, Nefris does an amazing job being able to make things super exciting for our students. Wanting to be able to pick up that day's serving of fruits and vegetables. And that mix of really fun fruits and also nutritious veggies to really encourage um, students just to be able to try a bite and say, hey, maybe I do like raw broccoli. We've also been able to work with local growers, as Linda mentioned, Javier through JSM in Prunedale, who did a really fun promotion this uh, fall with being able to get a butternut squash or some variety of winter squash to every student at those 12 elementary schools along with a bilingual Harvest a Month flyer that had a really fun recipe. My kids that go to uh, Calabasas Elementary were so excited to bring home their winter squash and wanted to cook it that night. Uh, pivoting to a different program, uh, we have uh, the WCSA Cooking and Garden Program uh, supported through Extended Learning, Fitness for Life, and the Sage Garden Project out of Encinitas. This allows us to be able to teach weekly K through five garden classes where we do hands-on cooking lessons, uh, fun bite-sized recipes alongside of uh, STEAM garden enrichment opportunities. The garden is campus-wide. If you'd ever like to go for a tour, happy to show you around. Um, but we've done a lot of fun things this school year to be able to promote eating seasonal fruits and vegetables. Um, some of the parents have reached out to me separately saying, hey, what was that recipe that my child came home wanting to be able to cook at home? Uh, we've also done fun uh, Friday promotions where we'll cook either the harvest of the month or other seasonal vegetables or produce from our garden, whether that's a citrus variety taste testing or being able to try a, a broccoli stir fry. Another project at Chavez Middle School We've uh, established this project way back in 2009, about the same time that started the Starlight School Garden. And uh, we've been able to do a lot of fun stuff since that time. The students have planted that food forest. Every tree that you see there has been planted by a different group of students over the years in the after school program. Uh, we do a lot of fun stuff after school, uh, including uh, cooking, where we prepare culturally relevant, nutrient-dense meals, where we all share together at the end of class, alongside of STEAM-focused garden projects. And with that, I'd like to introduce Ashling and Alejandro from Life Lab. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm Ashling Mitchell. I'm the Life Lab Partner Schools Program Leader. And this is my colleague. Hello, my name is Alejandro Ochoa, and um, I am the garden and cooking instructor right now at Starlight Elementary. And we're here to give you a snapshot of how Life Lab cultivates children's love of learning, healthy food, and nature through garden-based education in deep partnership with PVUSD. Currently, Life Lab has full-time garden instructors at seven PVUSD elementary school sites, and we're growing to all 16 PV elementary schools by the school year 2024 uh, to 2025. We celebrate all the people and the folks involved in bringing food from farms to our plates, including our families, our farmers, and our community partners, as you've heard from today. And our food education lessons are fact-based, they're well-researched, and they're designed to teach children simple, memorable, positive, and actionable concepts surrounding food and their overall well-being. Yeah, thank you. In our cooking classes, 70 to 80% of students liked or loved the recipes they tried with us, and 50 to 60% of our students try a new fruit or vegetable in each class. Um, when we're not directly cooking with the kids, we are hosting um, Next Generation Science um, in the garden classes in which we plant, grow, and eat our own fruits and veggies. Um, we know that students who plant and harvest their own fruits and veggies are definitely more likely to eat them. Um, so every time students um, visit any of our gardens, we are sure to celebrate our bounty with taste tests, including one bite lessons. And our current favorite one bite lesson is a dinosaur kale mint chew, which was invented by a kindergartner. <laughs> and it consists of two pieces of kale sandwiching a piece of garden grown mint. 
We know that children who receive 10 hours of this hands-on education, this garden-enhanced nutrition education, eat up to three times as many fruits or vegetables as their peers without this same access to these opportunities. So we at Life Lab, in deep partnership with PVUSD, are working hard to ensure that every PVUSD elementary student has access to our garden and cooking programs. And we believe that every child should have access to those life skills to grow, cook, and celebrate food, and to nourish ourselves in our community. And this year, thanks to PVUSD, we'll be able to expand from our seven current partner schools to 10 schools in August. And every year, we'll grow by three schools until we reach all elementaries. So thank you very much. Yes. I will pass it to Crystal with Cal Fresh. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a hard one to follow, but thank you, Ashling and Alejandro. Hi, everyone. I'm Crystal Caballero. I work with County Public Health in the CalFresh Healthy Living Program, and we've been partnering directly with the district for the past about three years, and we provide nutrition education currently in three schools, and we did that strategically where Life Lab currently wasn't, and we might reassess. We do physical activity training and classes um, with students as well as for teachers. We do smarter lunchroom movement technical assistance and training with Linda and her staff. And we also provide assessment support and facilitation support for the wellness committee. And so today I'll be talking, uh, I'll be sharing some high level results from the triennial assessment which we helped support this past school year. And again, I'll be moving really quickly, so we're getting to the data now. And again, this is all available, and I'm happy to come back if uh, further information is requested. So we did the three, we, we worked as a team, and I again want to acknowledge Kat from Alliance for Healthier Generation, who couldn't make it today. Uh, we worked in partnership with Linda and the Wellness Committee to, to do the assessment this past year. And we took three main steps. We looked at comparing the current policy to a model policy. Um, we assessed the extent to which every school complies with the wellness policy. And we also assessed progress on any predetermined goals for the wellness policy implementation. So this is just a brief uh, summary of the results from the wellness policy comparison. Again, I'll go quickly, you can refer back um, as needed. So the policy stood out pretty well in its mention of parent outreach, meal standards, which I'm, I'm sure, as you can see, clearly shines. And there's also strong language on policies and celebrations in terms of healthy celebrations. There's some room for improvement, as you can see. Um, I'll let you read these yourself um, at another time, but I will say one of the biggest recommendations from the committee is that the policy can be strengthened in regards to language around requirements. So for example, the policy says that uh, food should not be provided as a reward for good behavior or academic performance, and we recommend that the policy says food will not be provided as a reward. And that's just one example. There's instances like that across the policy, and we recommend um, a deeper look into that and a change to stronger language. When we looked at the goals, um, progress attaining goals, we came across some complications. Uh, for one, there hasn't been yet an action plan established to actually implement the wellness policy. There's a lot of great wellness activities happening, but the wellness policy itself is, is a little bit underrepresented and needs to be dusted off. Uh, oh, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, we also didn't see a broad enough representation within the wellness committee to provide expertise on the different parts of the policy. So we couldn't get that far in that part of the assessment. When we looked at all of the schools, so here is the, the colorful data summary of how well each school is complying with different questions in the assessment. So as Kat says, yellow is good and pink is bad. Um, I won't get into detail what all these questions are. Um, but there, uh, Kat is looking into that more deeply. So moving on to the recommendations. So 
Um, our first goal, or the first, so the committee and Linda and myself and Kat, we worked together to develop some recommendations, and here they are. So the first is in the slide I showed previously, there are some questions here, again, you can't see what they are because of the coding, that are actually required by the USDA final rule that some schools show that they're not compliant in. So we're looking into that a little bit more closely. Kat's been following up with those principles directly because it could be that they didn't understand the question or didn't have the right data to be able to answer. So that's step number one, is to make sure that we understand and address those compliant issues as an urgent priority. The second recommendation is that the wellness committee and leadership across the district update the wellness policy to utilize that stronger language and the recommendations that were set forth by the committee. The third goal is for each school to reignite their goal of creating a site wellness team. So a few years ago when Alliance for Healthier Generation came to the district, that was one of the goals. There's been, there's been a lot of great progress and as we know, COVID um, paused a lot. And so we recommend that we look at that again. And that is really to help the final goal that we have, is for the District Wellness Committee and leadership to develop a three-year district-wide implementation plan for the wellness policy so that we can actually create some achievable, measurable goals and also um, record the progress that we're making towards the wellness policy that we might not even be connecting, right? So I will leave it for that. Again, happy to provide more information um, at a later time, and I'll pass it back to Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. So um, basically, uh, when looking at the various sections of the wellness policy, I listed kind of the, the breakdown of the policy. Um, you can see all these topics, nutrition, physical activity, physical education, school health and safety, family, community, staff involvement, all of that, these topics all support um, the overall health and wellness of our students. So I just, I really think the idea of whole child is built like right into this policy. And sometimes I think this policy is misunderstood. People think of it as it's the, it's the, it's the packet that tells you you can't have cupcakes. You know, like you can't have cupcakes for celebration. So I think it is misunderstood, but it's really not what it's all about. So from the process of the assessment, um, the group, the wellness committee um, meeting throughout this year concluded that, you know, growing the members uh, will be key in the success of the implementation of the policy. And uh, the great thing is that there's been some initial discussions already with cabinet and we already are moving that goal forward. So there's already a movement there um, on what it'll look like for next year and making sure that there's always going to be continual progress. So um, I know that I've had a different partner in many different years as working with the committee. So I worked with someone from Healthy Start until they retired and then there was a gap and then I worked with a school nurse um, until they retired and there was a gap and then worked with another school nurse, gap. And then, so, so that type of Thing. We want to make sure it lives on and that there's it's set in place that people will be taking part and kind of making sure that this policy, um, you know, uh, is, is is implemented uh, regardless of who's in that place and regardless of whether someone get you know retires. So. Um, Many of the goals um, in the policy. So another good thing is that many of these goals you see are already being worked on. Um, in these other areas that we didn't have someone speaking on tonight either, lots of work happening there. So um, we feel like a lot of the policy is being done, um, but growing the group will help support the sites, make them more aware of the policy on its, and its contents. Um, so that was the recommendation. So thank you for your time and attention to this presentation and the results um, and listening to the highlights. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all the stakeholders who came and presented tonight. Are there any speakers to this item? No speakers. Okay, any comments from the board? I guess I would just um, like to um, comment that I'm very um, happy to hear that there's gonna be an action plan moving forward. Um, and part of that action plan is really making the larger community, including parents, aware of as a district, as a wellness committee, the type of work that you're really um, doing at the school site, um, especially in regards to promoting um, healthier options for students when it comes to school lunches, um, and then just the educational opportunities. Um, 
at least when it comes to the nutrition in school lunches, that's where we get, I think, at least for me, the most mm -hmm. concerns from parents, uh, that we're not doing enough, um, but yet we are. Um, so I think there's that disconnect. So I think uh, really having an action plan moving forward um, is gonna help uh, with that. Um, and uh, I can personally see how my child has benefited from you know the programs within the school site. He didn't like broccoli before, <laughs> and now he does. Um, and it's because of, um, I guess, the, the interaction and the education that goes along with that, the hands-on activities. Um, so it's uh, it's just great to see some of the work that's being done. So thank you to everyone involved in making that happen. No one down the send. Thank you for all your hard work. I know I was able to sit on some of your meetings and it was a lot of work that you guys have been doing. So thank you very much. Actually, I do have one question. Okay. If I may. <laughs> okay. Um, so you mentioned that this is um, K-12. But we do have preschools. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering uh, if the plan moving forward is to get them involved. We also, well. I mean, as the school meals program, we also feed uh, the state preschools full day, half day, migrant and seasonal head start. We right, also feed all of those programs. Right, but as far as like the educational pieces, oh. a different program. Sure, yeah. yeah. And, and I call ours nutrition promotion because technically, so we operate under cafeteria fund, which is a completely different fund and we're not, uh, you know, we're, the funding that we get, which is, you know, $4 a school lunch, um, like that's really paying for labor and food ingredients and the supplies, all of that. So we're, there's some things that we can't pay for and it gets tricky with nutrition education. So some of what we're doing is supporting interest in the school meals and nutrition promotion. Um, but that's where I reach out for help and try to support anyone that wants to do nutrition education. The part that we don't have as part of cafeteria and school meals um, because we need that partnership and so I really am happy um, to partner with agencies and um, people that want to support that um, but yeah nutrition education is um, yeah a, a whole nother piece thank you Thanks, Linda. Great uh, report. Really beautiful things that you're doing in your department and um, you know, one of the first times I ever came up to this podium was probably 12 years ago when I complained about the school lunches that were um, generally just horrible and like every single meal was a fast food item like pizza, chicken nuggets, hamburgers, fries, I mean every single meal. Um, and none of it, all of it was packaged in plastic and all none of it was organic. So we put the very first um, salad bar on a campus and parents paid for that ourselves. Um, the Martins actually paid for that, provided it. Um, we weren't allowed to use any of the um, produce in the school garden because the district told us that the kids might get some kind of E. coli from using our own organic produce that we were growing in our life lab garden. So we've come a long way is I guess what I'm trying to say. So I'm very pleased by the changes that were made under your leadership. So thank you so much. Um, just a quick qu question or comment. The wellness policy includes more than nutrition. So what I heard tonight was a nice overview of like the nutrition services and Life Lab and public yeah. health initiatives, but I didn't hear anything about physical activity or mental health wellness, which I think also needs to be included in this wellness policy. It used to be. I don't I don't see it yeah. here today. It's I mean, in I, the policy. It yeah. is in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's um, part of what was assessed by um, the school sites, the self-assessment that we showed some of the data for. Right. Um, and I think that's what we were saying was part of the challenge as we um, move forward with the committee. The goal will be to expand um, who's involved and that way those sections of the wellness policy can have someone speaking to, the, to their expertise. Um, because I, 
you know, obviously, as the the Food and Nutrition Services Department, we can um, provide you know our section and do as much as we can to sure. to gather the information. But um, I want to make sure that the experts in their field can represent those areas. And that was part of as we're learning to do the assessment for the very first time and learning what that looked like, um, learning how much time it took to oversee the committee and the data that need to be collected. Um, it will be a better process if there are people involved in their sections yeah. to be able to provide that information. That's great. Mm -hmm. I know some schools have release time where they have PE teachers. That, that That's the specialty that they've chosen on their campuses. I know at Valencia we chose science, so we have science release teachers. Um, but every single one of the teachers should be doing PE. Like, I don't know how that's really implemented. It would be great to have a more comprehensive report on, on the wellness that's happening on the campuses. But you did a great job, and thank you. Okay, thanks. Next up are action items. Uh, we'll start with 10.1, approval of a board appointed personnel commissioner. And this report will be by Pam Shanks. Thank Good you. Good evening, me again. So th um, this is the action item where I ask the board to appoint Mr. Casey O'Brien as the board appointed personnel commissioner to finish out the unexpired term. We have no speakers. No speakers, okay. Any um, comments or discussion from the board? I'll move to approve. I'll second. Okay. Um, wholeheartedly endorse this appointment. He's wonderful and he'll bring a lot of expertise in this area to our district. We're lucky to have him back. So, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up is item 10.2, our Measure L audit. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, as you may remember, a few board meetings ago, we did bring our financial audit, which due to COVID was delayed a bit. So now we are bringing the Measure L audit, which we do as part of um, our Measure L bond to ensure that it is audited and reviewed by a, an external auditor. Um, they did do a review of our Measure L, and I am pleased to say that they found zero findings and found that everything was being done properly and accounted for correctly into its own fund separately, and everything was um, following um, the intent of Measure L. So we have presented this on May 19th to the COC. We let them know they had zero concerns and were pleased to see a clean review. So I asked the board to approve this independent audit of our Measure L funds. Thank you. Do we have any speakers? None. Okay, any questions or comments from the board? I'll move to approve. We'll second. I do have a question. So I see on the total li liabilities and fund balance, so there's still a fund balance of 27 million? million? So as, is that right? Sorry, that is correct as of the end of 21, 22, or 2021, since this is the audit from prior year, this isn't current year audit. So we have spent quite a bit of that 27 million. You'll remember we've been bringing forward the Minty White Project. Renaissance is doing its paving and its painting uh, this summer. We also have um, some of that money was expended on um, the project at EA Hall. So a lot of that actually has been expended of that 27 million. And we do have an updated list of remaining projects on our website at the Measure All website. Okay, thank you very much. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations on a very clean audit. Item 10.3, approve uh, program services and facilities agreement between PBUSD and Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance. Good evening, President, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I am happy to be here um, with PVPSA looking for approval on our annual agreement. Uh, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance proposes services and supports available for students in all schools for the upcoming year. Modifications to service models have been made to accommodate the needs of students in the current year. PVPSA observed increased need for services as well as PVUSD, um, likely associated with the impacts of the pandemic and related factors. Uh, PVPSA um, 
and PBUSD are proud to work together and have services at the Wellness Center, at school sites, and at agency uh, facilities located throughout the community. I would uh, like to invite Erica Padilla Chavez, Chavez up here to also read part of this. And I'm sure you're all happy to see her here. I'm happy to see her here. Well, first of all, <clears throat> good evening, President De Serpa, um, members of the board. I know you're all looking at me like, I know where you're going, Erica. Uh, but I'm here still wearing my PVPSA hat very proudly, and, and I'll address you know, any question you have uh, with regard to my transition <laughs> in a bit. But I, I do want to speak um, a little bit about um, the uh, proposed services that are before you and, and really highlight um, some of the things that we have, um, uh, was just mentioned about what we found to be true this year. Um, the crisis the crisis calls into our agencies. Um, we, I used to say we used to get 50 to 20 a week. That's like average daily calls now. Um, and the crisis vary, and sometimes it's the social and emotional counselors that identify they need additional support to de-escalate a situation or to create a safety plan or whatnot. Sometimes it's an administrator calling. So we're requesting an additional crisis therapist for the year. We recognize that we're still kind of in that um, getting back to a regulated state, and we're hopeful that after next year we can ease our way back into some of the basic services that we, we've been operating with. In addition to that, um, we are proposing a dedicated case manager for Watsonville High School. There's been a lot that our team has done this year to respond to the needs of Watsonville High and in speaking to um, incoming um, student services director, um, Ivan, um, he recommended that, that we increase the, the stable support at that school, just given the, the demands in this past year. And then lastly, um, we established during the pandemic the what we call the Any Payer Therapeutic Program. As you know, PVPSA offers services to those with Medi-Cal. That's how we leverage um, the resources. But during the pandemic, we were hearing there a lot of students, and they were coming to us, can you please take care of us because I, we don't have access to a therapist through our Blue Shield or whatever private insurance they had. So we, we established a team of two uh, to be of support in addition to what the school it was able to do with the mental health clinicians that you have brought on board. That program is completely impacted. We've had to turn away kids uh, because the situation in our region is still saturated. There's a bigger demand for services, not enough supply. And the school's done a marvelous job in trying to um, bring in additional supports in-house. Um, and I'm glad that you have, because I think that the list would be much, much longer if it weren't. But there still is that imbalance. But that's a regional problem. That's not necessarily pertinent to PVUSD alone. It's, it's happening everywhere, as you probably have read. So um, we're also, I just want to highlight that this particular year, we have been really pouring our support to the Pajaro Las Lomas community. There has been a lot that our team has done, and we've leveraged a lot of grant funding to be able to support the community out there. And I'm very proud to say that all of our funders who supported us for um, the families at Ohlone Hall and Baja Middle School um, have committed an additional couple years of funding to support the families out there. Um, and, and that's an area that our team is very dedicated to ensuring continual support. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions um, related to this or otherwise. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. And it's um, I will use my little bit of my time to thank you all for putting the children of this community at the heart of everything you do. I know you have a thankless job um, as, a, as a public servant. But I really, really do want to appreciate you for putting children at the, at the center of everything. And Dr. Rodriguez, I've seen the district transform uh, my, during my eight years here. And it's beautiful to see fresh fruits and vegetables. It's beautiful to see the focus on mental health. And um, I congratulate you for the great work you, you continue to do. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item? And we're sorry, Erica, for the late. Oh, that's okay. I had service. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've got a long drive home. Sorry about that. I have no uh, speakers to the sign. Okay. Any comments um, from the board or questions? Jen Holm? 
So I know in the past there have been comments about why you know have a partnership with PVPSA and, and don't you know hire or and utilize in-house personnel. Um, I also know that we've had shifts in the last few months, and maybe it's years at yeah. this point. Um, can you just explain a little bit about the benefits to our students of our current setup? <clears throat> Well, we could probably both, so you know, PVPSA is not our only partner, it's our biggest partner. And one of the biggest benefits uh, would be the, the clinicians that they have at the schools, uh, the access to crisis counselors immediately, uh, the relationships that the staff have with the clinicians. I can speak to um, the one of the newest um, ways that we are trying to be more efficient with our services and more transparent with, for everyone to know the pathway of our services is this year we started using NowPow and PVPSA is one of the partners that has agreed to also use this, this um, closed loop referral system to help us know one of the biggest issues is people make a referral and they say what happened to it. So it, as we're, we're in this partnership, stepping into using NowPow as well. So again, we're, we're not duplicating efforts and people know when a, a student has been served or if they haven't been served, we can quickly communicate and get them service. I'll just add, um, Trustee Holm, that um, you know, it's interesting to, as I reflect on the eight years, eight years ago, really when you think about the social emotional staff that the district had, it, you really didn't have much. Nothing. It was PVPSA. Um, no, we had nothing. You we, had nothing. We had only academic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then over the years, what has happened is you've recognized that, you know, you need to serve the whole child and you've integrated additional staffing, um, some of who can do mental health and some who are more like your case managerial or linkers or uh, referral support, right? Um, and what has happened over the years, and I think this is important to highlight, is that PVPSA used to do a lot of that administrative stuff that you have your social emotional counselors and other staff doing, we now can focus on just doing the service component because of the referrals coming in by a wider network of people that are are doing more of the what I call pre-screening, right, and the assessment so that when they come to us, they come to us already needing the service. We, it used to be that we would get the student, we would do an assessment, and it wasn't fitting for the service because there was nobody really doing that on your end. So what that has done is that really streamlined the way we are um, uh, providing the service and ensuring that the child, when they come to us, they're able to get the service. So over the years, you've probably heard, oh, you don't qualify, you don't, you don't meet the criteria. We're seeing less and less of that as a result. I think the biggest benefit is knowing, from a district's perspective, is knowing that there is an agency that is dedicated to providing care to the student community. And um, the other piece is that over the years, the staff have developed awareness of the importance of balancing uh, academic needs of a student and the therapeutic needs of a student. So it's intentionally um, factored when we are asking a student to pull out, for example, they will never pull out a student out of the same class consecutively because the therapists know it's important for them to go to math, it's important for them to go to um, English, it's important for them to um, get their education. So those are the nuances of our partnership that I think are unique um, and specialized. Uh, and I'm hopeful that as the years uh, progress that uh, we continue to perfect the things that I know always need improvement, but we're committed to PVUSD, so thank you. So Erica, specifically I think, um, maybe I'm wrong, but if you could just speak to the matching funds and, oh, sure. and oh, how you, the, the you leveraging. support that. The leveraging oh yeah, yeah, the yeah. yeah. Thank you, the, the quantification of the dollars, yes. So um, I, I mentioned that we are a, um, we're considered a county mental health partner, both for Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. What does that mean? That the counties have authorized PVPSA to bill Medi-Cal for mental health delivery. What does that mean? The, the, the contract stipulates specific services that are unique, but over two and a half million dollars is leveraged from state and federal funding, which is what makes Medi-Cal, um, so that we can provide the therapeutic care. Right, that that is not even a part of this. So this is 
not even a part of the real mental health services that we provide. We leverage, we leverage a lot of money to provide that support. So from a cost factor perspective, right, um, the, the, the millions of dollars we're using for services is money that the district doesn't necessarily have to go and fund and, and, and produce, right? We're bringing it to the table via the state and federal funding program. So that is what the, the uniqueness of, of the partnership, and it's definitely a return on investment, I guess, if you want to look at it from a budget perspective as well. Erica, can you talk about, um, about when, when, when you first took your seat as um, the CEO or uh -huh. executive, um, the amount of money that you've brought in in terms of the grants that you've been able to capture yeah, on sure. behalf of the, our community? Sure, sure, sure. Let's see. I was I was just doing an analysis of that because um, our team is equally preparing a tentative budget for for our board, and we were doing a historical overview of how did we get started. Um, I think when I came in, the the agency had a budget of 1.7 million. Um, we're hitting six, and we have a team now of over 60 employees. When I started, I think we had a team of maybe 19 employees. Um, and what I walked into was this demand and this supply. And the pressure that I felt the first year was, PVPSA is not serving people. But it had to do with the sheer you know, small volume of people that we had in our team. So I went to work and I knew that I needed to expand our Medi-Cal programming. So I took what was a half a million dollar program and have grown it to be two and a half million, right? This is the money you don't pay for. This is the money that I was able to leverage with both Monterey County and Santa Cruz County. They're essentially, uh, the vehicle for resources into the district. I think also in addition to that, with the guidance of the board and the support of the board, we build a beautiful integrated behavioral health facility which proved to be the best thing ever for the pandemic because that facility became the safe haven for so many kids that could not do the telehealth, right? Everybody shifted to telehealth. And I, I also, I'm very proud of this. PVPSA was the only mental health agency in the entire county that kept its stores open during the pandemic. County mental health closed its stores and they were only doing telehealth. Every other agency, that's exactly what they did. You know, rightly so. It was scary. We, we have to factor the safety of, of families. But what was happening was when we were calling our, our, our students, they were saying, I don't have the equipment at home. I live with three or four families. I don't have a quiet place where I could do private therapy. So we had to take this beautiful building that we opened up a month before the pandemic and we plexiglass the heck out of it, right? So it's still there, right? We had to modify and pivot. But that facility really generated a lot of, um, I think, goodwill, much like your garden and what was discussed earlier, that it really did has brought the community to be closer to the district. That's exactly what happened with PVPSA. And as a result of that, we have been able to secure ongoing support um, from foundations that continue to stand up when they hear PVPSA. The California Department of Public Health has become a, um, a core partner of the agency. Just today I got a call from them. They want to give the uh, PVPSA a three-year grant for a lot of money. So even though I'm leaving, I'm leaving you in, good, in a good place. Um, you know, so I just think that uh, the work itself and the dedication of the team and the focus and the relentless uh, effort to grow the service Services, the community has is acknowledging it. Funders are acknowledging it, and uh, I think the agency is in a great a great situation. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Are there any other comments or questions from the board? You know, I think you should tackle the financial piece. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Erica, thank you for. Um, for the presentation, for all that you did to bring the agency into the spotlight of helping kids, that you really created a lot of equity. I'm, I know when you took over, it was in bad financial shape, and so we, we really thank you for making it viable again and shining. Thank you. And we're going to really miss you, Erica's leaving. She's taken a job at Second Harvest Food Bank, mm -hmm. so we're really going to miss her at the helm. Um, tonight, I'll be abstaining from this vote because I'm on the PVPSA board, but I, um, uh, I support 
what you do there and thank you and thank your staff thank you. please on behalf of the board okay did we get a first yeah I'll, I'll make, make a one. motion <laughs> okay motion second Jennifer second second okay all those in favor aye aye, aye. and I'll abstain motion carries four one two thank, thank you. you so much thank you, thank you. Um, President DeSerpa? Yes. Um, just point of order, I'd like to make a motion to extend the meeting to 11.30. Okay. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you. Uh, item 10.4, a revised class description uh, benefits analyst. This is Pamela Shanks. Good evening, President DeSerpa, uh, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, this item before you tonight is a revised class description of our benefits analyst position. Um, when positions become vacant, um, it's a good time to review the needs of the department to determine if there's any changes that need to be made um, based on the work that's being done. Um, it also allows human resources to accurately recruit for positions um, when they do become vacant, um, making those changes. Uh, so this position recently did become vacant and it allowed the manager of payroll and benefits to review the needs of her department. Um, the revised class description is attached um, for your review and also a change in the salary, moving it from range 55 to 50, which does align with the payroll analyst classification, uh, which is similar in nature and scope. Um, since the district moved from being self-insured to instead working with CISC, there are some duties that were removed as they were no longer being performed by the incumbent. So that's the reason for the, the change in uh, range. Um, the Personnel Commission did approve this revised class description and range placement in their, at their May meeting. Um, and the district and CSCA have also come to agreement through an MOU um, on the duties and additionally the salary placement recommended by the Personnel Commission. Uh, so this evening I ask for approval of the revised class description and the revised uh, classified salary schedule as well. Okay, any speakers? No. Any questions or comments? Entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries 502. Thank you. Thank you. Item 10.5, uh, PVUSD College and Career Center, uh, MOU with Cabrillo College. Prepared by Ms. Julie Edwards, our CTE coordinator, and Chrissy McLean. Good evening, Board President DeSerpa, Board Trustees, and Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Julie Edwards, and I serve in PVUSD as a CTE coordinator, and my colleague Chrissy McLean serves as a coordinator of counseling. Tonight, we'll be co-presenting two items. These next two items, 10.5 and 10.6, affirm the growing depth and quality of the relationship between PVUSD and Cabrillo College with a clear demonstration of the mutual commitment to our students' success in post-secondary education and engagement while in high school. Working with our valued partners, our Cabrillo partners, Herlinda Brady, newly retired Dean of CTE, Eddie Cervantes, Director of Dual Enrollment, and Sally Larder, Dean of Academic Counseling, Career, and Educational Support Services. Um, uh, with them, we are moving decisively toward highly connected programming between PBUSD and Cabrillo College. So I'll begin with presenting 10.5. Um, mm -hmm. And as you see, if you could go to the, um, the next slide. I will read um, part of the agenda action item. However, you'll see as I'm reading, uh, much of what I'm reading is there on the outcomes. So what are the outcomes of this? So in an effort to provide a full complement of supportive services to PVUSD students in the college and career centers at Aptos High, PV High, and Watsonville High Schools, Cabrillo College has committed to providing three full-time student support specialists at each school with adjacent counseling department consultation and guidance to inform their work in collaboration with PVUSD. This service to PBUSD students will augment the existing continuum of services in the PBUSD College and Career Centers. 
Expertise provided by Cabrillo College staff will enrich services for PVUSD students in promoting college and career awareness, preparation, application processes, and simplifying the dual enrollment processes. The resulting coordinated services will support the PVUSD's expanded definition of student success with more students succeeding and accomplishing their post-secondary education, career, and life goals. Staff recommends the board consider and approve the MOU. And there is, um, I can speak to this a little. Um, these outcomes were co-designed um, with Cabrillo and co-created. All of these outcomes, as stated in, in um, the agenda item, are all to benefit our mutual students. Are there any speakers? We have no speakers to this item. Oh, is there another slide? I'm sorry, I thought your presentation was over. <laughs> oh, I have a clicker. <laughs> In conclusion, um, <laughs> this slide is here. Um, thanks, Julie. Um, this slide is here sort of to recognize the growth, you know, under the direction of Dr. Rodriguez and all of the support of the board and the CT coordinator, Julie, and everyone else, you know, making all of these partnerships all to benefit our kids. Uh, this is sort of a celebratory slide. And this MOU um, with Cabrillo is just one more um, added benefit for our students. Okay. Are there any speakers? No speakers to this item. Any comments from the board? Jen Holm? Um, I, I will be abstaining from voting on this item in the next. Um, I, I think these are fantastic partnerships, but I'm a Cabrillo employee, and although my department is not currently directly affected, there's conversations about expansion, so I feel like there's a conflict of interest. But Thank you. Team. Any comments down here or from Trustee Soto? I'm ready no. to make a motion. Okay, I do have a question, of course. So there'll be... Um, a support person hired by Cabrillo in every one of our college and career centers, just on the comprehensives. Mm -hmm. So in the past, there's been a support person. Typically, I can't remember. I thought they were from UCSC with Gear Up or something. It's now access, but they'll be there still. This mm -hmm. is an added person. This is an added person. Mm -hmm. So that's my point. That person that, yeah, the, it was my experience being a mom of a high school student that there really was no help for a lot of the population that would go in there looking for help. So I'm hopeful that having an extra person there will improve access to kids who really want to go to college who need the help doing, you know, all of the things that they need to do to to f finish an application and apply for, for, you know, scholarships and everything. Yes, they would be um, working in tandem with those partners in the the college and career center, and it sort of would, um, you know, all all of the, the the folks in the college and career centers have the same goal of making sure students have access and knowledge to all of the different college and career opportunities, and oftentimes people are at different levels of of where they want to choose to go, and so having a multitude of people that can help and assist along any of the pathways that they choose, whether it's, it's private, UCs, Cabrillo, career, and for whichever pathway, we will have a, a built support system in those. That's great, and I haven't been in any of those college or career centers recently. Have they been refreshed at all, the interiors? There is in this, not um, the most recent one, might have been Aptos High. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. So part, some of this is also in the um, the monies that Cabrillo has promised for PVUSD comes with these support specialists as well as some infra infrastructure monies to um, add some more to furniture improve. or dividers or things Great. like that. Mm -hmm. oh, wonderful. Okay. So we have, did we have a motion? And a second. I can't remember. No, okay. Maria made the motion. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? 
Okay, motion carries um, four, one, two. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Item 10.6. Item 10.6. Um, yeah. I will also sh share a little bit of information from the agenda item. The attached 2022 through 2025 Cabrillo College and PVUSD CCAP MOU, and CCAP means College and Career Access Pathway Partnership Agreement, which is based on legislation, is a renewal and expansion of the prior three-year MOU with Cabrillo. The CCAP agreements like this one enable the community colleges to extend cost-free dual enrollment courses to high school students and every semester the potential for a new appendix is provided to reflect additional courses to be offered to PVUSD high school students, which means that each semester will bring an appendix to this, demonstrating growth in this program. Um, the financial commitment on the part of PVUSD is related to any textbooks required. Cabrillo College funds all the rest, the faculty, whatever's needed on their, on their side and um, applicable to the course. And dual enrollment opportunities that are attached in this MOU um, are connect to CTE pathways as well as general education courses that benefit our students in a variety of ways, including early college credit attainment, acclimation to a college environment while in high school, and acceleration of de a degree attainment post-secondary. Um, and on the next slide, let's see if I can get that right. There we go. So in summary, these outcomes are the outcomes that are contained within that description. And this, this agreement was negotiated around an additional three years, which Cabrillo is delighted to extend to us. And um, it prioritizes courses that we are prioritizing within our district. So you can see on the next slide, you can see in 22-23, We'll be offering Elementary American Sign Language 1 and 2, um, Ballet Folklorico 1 and 2, Health Communications, and Medical Terminology, and in the future, the next appendix that, that we bring to the board will probably reflect something around engineering or engineering technology, biotech, agriculture-related courses, and information and communications technology. So those, those are the ones we're working on for the not-so-distant future and the ones at the top are the ones that we have planned and students scheduled into for next year. That's great. Any speakers to this item? None. Okay, any questions from the board? No, okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve. A we'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Oh, I'm, Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. And the, sorry, there's one abstention, Jennifer Holmes. So motion carries 412. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is item 10.7 a contract for assistant superintendent of secondary education, Ms. Lisa Aguirre Lewis. Yeah. Thank you so much. So as I mentioned at a previous board meeting, we have reorganized our cabinet to where now we have just four cabinet members, myself and four cabinet members. Um, Lisa current currently is our assistant superintendent of curriculum and instruction. The plan is to remove that assistant superintendent and um, so Lisa will be shifting to our assistant superintendent of secondary. Although many of you know her Previously, prior to that, as our assistant superintendent of elementary, she actually has personally, um, the, her background is in secondary, and I know she will do a fabulous job supporting um, our new reorganized structure, and we'll have a strong cabinet team with the four of them and myself. And so, as we have talked about before, cabinet members are the only members who actually cannot work a day past their contract, and so Lisa's contract is coming up in just three short weeks, or maybe it's two, two short weeks. Um, she was willing to wait because we needed to do the reorganization, and so I appreciate her being patient on that. Um, it is a challenging situation, only having two weeks left on one's contract, but she's been willing to um, wait it out, so I ask for your approval of her contract. 
Are there any speakers? We do have one, okay. Chris Webb. Since, since coming to PVSD, I've always found Lisa to be a genuinely caring, competent, and earnest person. I felt supported by her as a teacher. I applaud her oversight of the Ethnic Studies program at PVSD and consider my participation therein to be the most valuable and meaningful PD I've had in my seven years with the district. And given the present political climate in the country, I especially admire her courage and competency of leadership with respect to administering that program. She proved to be a team player this year, especially with being willing to um, come back into the classroom. Um, and I think she's a good fit for this position. And reflecting on the decisions that came from this position this year and the impact they've had at the working conditions for my site, um, I'm hopeful about this appointment. I'm hopeful that Renaissance can again become a restorative place with effective interventions done before absences mount, before suspensions are issued, and before graduation prospects are compromised. I'm hopeful for leadership wise enough to know better than to cast aside working institutions developed at the state level by stakeholders. Um, I'm hopeful Lisa's appointment will bolster the credibility of district rhetoric and teachers need to be able to trust their administrators, especially when new initiatives from admin demand teachers make themselves vulnerable. So I'm hopeful um, Lisa will bolster that sense of trust and in turn, improve educational outcomes in the district. Thank you. Thank you. Looking for a motion, or I'm sorry, are there any comments? Okay. Um, so I know that uh, Ms. Uh, Gary Lewis has, you know, I, I knew that she had a, the background in secondary education and, and is qualified for this role. Um, it's still a transition, so can you tell me a little bit about how the district will be supporting her and her team during this time? Sure. Well, I think of almost all of us, um, although I guess I would say Allison may, may disagree because she probably has longer term. Um, district experience. I will say that Lisa's been with the district for an extensive amount of time, so she knows our system well. Um, we will, as a team, we always come together. We're actually going to have our cabinet advance in just a couple of um, a couple of weeks, and so we'll work together on how we will support each other. Um, as needed, we'll provide if we need to, um, coaching and support. I think sometimes we see um, executive coaching and coaching as a negative, but it actually isn't. It's actually a positive for that. So if she needs that level of support, we'll make sure and, and provide it. Um, we have a strong expanded cabinet that we meet with monthly, and so we'll continue to pivot and, and move forward. But. Um, I've, I have all the faith that um, we will actually be able to have a pretty seamless transition, um, but we'll make sure and do any planning and action steps around that during cabinet events in the next two weeks. Thank you. Any other speakers or questions? I'll move to approve. Okay, I'll second. I think she does a great job. Thank you for your professionalism and um, Thank you for sticking with the district. You've been here a long time and I know you drive the hill and I know that's been really hard on your family and we appreciate everything that you do here and you're very well liked by principals and administrators and I think teachers alike. So thank you, Lisa. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Is anybody opposed? Great, motion carries 502. Congratulations. Okay, next up we have our consent agenda. Um, does anything, anybody want to pull anything off of it? Okay, looking for a motion to approve. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll, I'll second. second. Okay, first and second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, I would like to just say that we're acknowledging the donation of Steve and, um, I can't read it, Steve and Carmela Doutoff for the, their um, generous donation to the Emerald Lagasse Kitchen. What was the amount on that? $2,500. So thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, also a donation accepted with gratitude from Taylor's Office City. 
$17,056. Wow. And the amount of $17,056.22. Yeah, okay. Thank you to the donors. Um, next up, we'll do uh, action on closed session, item 14.1. Okay. All right, under closed session item 2.1, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on June 8th, 2022 with 14 and 17 additional action items. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Okay, under item 2.2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on June 8th, 2022 with five and five additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 502. Okay, and then we have a couple of announcements. <clears throat> Announcement number one, the Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of uh, Ricky Maldonado as the new academic coordinator at Mar Vista Elementary School. Mr. Maldonado has been serving the students of PVUSD since 2016 as a social emotional counselor and as an assistant principal. He obtained his bachelor's of arts in human communication from CSU Monterey Bay a pupil personnel services credential from National University and administrative credential from Santa Clara. We're proud to welcome Mr. Maldonado to his new role in PBUSD. Announcement number two, the Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Ben Slider, Slider as the new coordinator of student services, Mr. Slider has been working with students since 1999 when he began his teaching career at EA Hall Middle School. He continued teaching at North Monterey County High School and then moved into administration at that school as well. He returned to PBUSD in 2014 as an assistant principal at Aptos High and was in that role until his move into his new position. His extensive experience working with students will serve him well in, this, in his new role. Mr. Slider holds a bachelor's degree in science from Humboldt State, a teaching credential from National University, and administrative credential also from National University. We're proud to welcome him to his new role in PBUSD. Announcement number three. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Joshua Phillips as the new academic coordinator of Calabasas Elementary. Mr. Phillips has been working with students since 2012 at the secondary level. He has been a teacher, coach, and administrator. He joined PBUSD as an assistant principal at Aptos Junior High in 2018 and has served in that position since then. He's excited to move to an elementary site to expand his learning experience. Mr. Phillips holds a bachelor's degree in history from UCSB, a teaching credential from National University, and a master's and admin credential from Cal State Northridge. We're proud to welcome Mr. Phillips to his new position in PUSD. Announcement number four. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Roizen, I'm sorry, Roisin Fahey Bibo as the new academic coordinator for Rio del Mar Elementary. Mrs. Bibo started her career at the International Academic Assistant Program in Sinaloa, Mexico. After that, she joined PBUSD in 2005 as an elementary teacher at Minty White Elementary and worked there until 2014 when she moved to Mar Vista. Mrs. Bebo holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in History and Languages from UCSC, as well as a Master's in Education. She obtained her administrative credential from CSUMB. We're proud to welcome Mrs. Bebo to her new position in PBUSD. Announcement number five. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Peggy Pugh as the Executive Director of Teaching and Learning. Mrs. Pugh has been working with students since 1997. She began her career as a social studies teacher at Aptos High and continued as an activities director, assistant principal, and finally as a principal of Aptos High School for the last six years. She earned her BA in American Studies from UCSC and her master's in education from San Jose State. She holds a single subject credential in social science and an 
and an administrative credential from San Jose State. We're proud to welcome Mrs. Pugh to her new position in PVUSD. And I think that's all we have for tonight. Thank you, um, Trustee Orozco. Our next uh, meeting, item 15.1, our next upcoming board meeting will be held on June 22nd here in the boardroom at 7 p.m. And this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.